And it is my pleasure to sort of steer you along this, uh, this wonderful day that we have planned. Now, we've had such a busy week in AI uh, with the AI Safety Summit uh, at Bletchley Park and with many, and we, with what may turn out to be the highest concentration of AI policy announcements and initiatives that the world has seen to date. What is fascinating is that a year ago, around this time, ChatGPT was not even launched. The 30th of November 2022 was the date when the world got access to ChatGPT and when the narrative on AI development and advancement started to shift towards the storyline that dominates today's headlines. But as we hear so many voices this week uh, point to the importance of AI safety, through this event, we wanted to turn the spotlight on one bit of the AI narrative that for us, as researchers, as policymakers, as civil society, has not changed and should never change. The bit of the narrative that tells us that AI advancement should be for the benefit of all. The focus of today will be on advancing equity-driven perspectives on global AI governance. We'll start the morning with a welcome from Queen Mary University of London's president and a keynote address from UNESCO's Assistant Director General on the importance of inclusive rights-based versions of AI ethics and governance. We'll then turn our attention to groups of people whose voices have been missing in the conversations around AI and AI policy. The session on AI and children's rights will bring to light how children's lives are increasingly shaped by AI, yet children are not part of these technologies development and governance. And the session on global data justice and generative AI will put the spotlight on the communities left behind by AI development and the importance of equity driven models of AI production and use. Right before lunch, we will have a fireside chat to explore the transformative effects of the ri rising generative AI era on teaching, learning, and scholarship with an emphasis on the role that responsible data science and public communication can play in managing risks to academic and research integrity. We will reconvene after lunch with a renewed determination to find a constructive path forward. The session on inclusive international AI governance in the age of foundation models will focus on the importance of standards and methods of evaluation that take into account the interest of impacted communities around the globe. And the final session of the day will propose an answer to the question of how do we put AI ethics and governance into practice. At this session, we will launch the National Public Sector AI Ethics and Governance in Practice program, a set of eight workbooks mandated in the UK's national AI strategy that will update the UK's official public sector AI ethics and safety guidance. In launching this program, developed for and with the public sector, we hope to show the public sector is ideally placed to set standards of good practice and to serve as a model for the broader AI innovation ecosystem. So that's the plan for today. We hope that you are as excited as we are about today's event and we look forward to a day of learning and dialogue for all. Thank you. Okay. okay. Uh, thanks, Kosmina. So just the boring stuff now, a little bit of housekeeping. Um, just to say that this event's being li live streamed today and filming and recording is also gonna be taking place um, in the room. Um, the recording of the events and uh, all the other sort of media material will be made available to the, to the community after. Um, this event is running as part of the AI Fringe, so uh, we're adhering to their code of conduct. Um, that can be accessed by just going to the AI Fringe event website. But in any case, um, we just ask that all participants be considerate, respectful, and collaborative, both in the room and online. Don't, don't need to say it, though I was giving a talk yesterday and someone almost punched me. Um, uh, these, some of these are very incendiary topics. Um, but we won't, we, we won't broach those today. Um, <clears throat> we are not expecting any fire alarms, uh, if, but, so if you, if you hear one, please do make your way out of the building via the green emergency exit signs. And finally, uh, as we do the Q&A for each of the panels, we'll be uh, using Slido. So uh, it's, it's the Slido website, so www.slido.com. And when you hit the website, just type in hashtag AI fringe. Uh, that was a... Uh, the brainchild of, of our wonderful program manager, Isabel Malcolm. Uh, we got AI, hashtag AI Fringe, which you would think this week would be a hard one to get. Um, so without uh, further ado, 
if, if I may uh, just uh, express extreme appreciation for the presence of the, the, the president of Queen Mary, uh, Colin Bailey, who will kick off the event today by saying a few words. Uh, thank you, David, uh, and I hope I don't get punched. Um, but welcome, everyone, to Queen Mary. Uh, we are a unique, research-intensive global university, one that opens the doors of opportunity to anyone who has the potential to succeed. You're here today in the Octagon, uh, and you're on one of our nine campuses in London. Queen Mary was founded from four institutions, St. Bartholomew's Medical College, London Hospital Medical College, Westfield College, and Queen Mary College. And our history goes back to 1123, when St. Bartholomew's Hospital was formed. But of course, our founding institution is one of the first medical schools in England was formed in 1785. But today, you're in the old library of Queen Mary College, which was formed in 1887. Now, all our founding institutions were formed to provide hope and opportunity. And here at Queen Mary College, it was founded in 1887 to provide education and hope and opportunity to the less privileged population in the East End of London. Today, we can't fit our 33,000 students in this old library. We've got another library that they actually fit in. But today, you are sitting in the history of one of our founding institutions, Queen Mary College, which was founded and this building built in 1887. So this week's Artificial Intelligence Safety Summit has captured global attention. It is therefore timely and important we continue that conversation here today. And there's no better place than Queen Mary for a discussion about responsible and safe AI. Our passion and global standing for innovation, coupled with our unmatched commitment to inclusion, social mobility, and diverse and meaningful participation means we have a distinctive contribution to make to these discussions. We see this combination of research excellence and inclusion already embedded in the AI research we are doing here at Queen Mary. We know it leads to stronger outcomes with greater real world impact. Take for example, our Digital Environment Research Institute, which is our flagship university research institute and center for interdisciplinary research and external collaboration, where responsible and trustworthy AI is one of our strategic themes, which of course is led by Professor David Leslie. Another example is our application of AI to genomics, where responsible and safe use of big data is enabling us to address, address significant unmet healthcare need here in our local community, where there is inequalities embedded within our community and community in London, and where the health, healthy life expectancy of women in Tower Hamlets is only 55.4 years. And there are many more examples where we are using AI in a responsible and trustworthy manner, earning trust from our partners and stakeholders. We know that we're in the middle of a technological revolution, but alongside the promise of AI, there are risks and challenges that must be managed to ensure AI systems work for all people organizations and society. Challenges surrounding the governance of safe and responsible AI are universal, impacting stakeholders across society 
and around the world. It is therefore important to ensure and implement a wide-ranging conversation around what safe and responsible AI means and how to regulate it without stifling innovation. We need to consider the insights and lived experience of affected people from every walk of life and from every corner of the globe. Queen Mary's values and approach provide essential ingredients to progress understanding of how we can create more ethical and safe AI governance. Our vibrant culture has local and global engagement at its heart, which was recognized with the award of the only National Coordinating Center for Public Engagement, Platinum Engagement Watermark. No other university has yet been awarded this watermark. I'm therefore thrilled to open the AI Summit event, AI at a Turning Point, in partnership with the Alan Turing Institute. And it is a pleasure to welcome you all here today and our speakers. I now would like to hand back to Professor David Leslie to introduce our first speaker. Okay, without further ado, it's time for our, our keynote. Um, we are uh, really honored to have uh, Gabriela Ramos uh, join us. Uh, Gabriela is the Assistant Director General of the, for the Social, Science and Hu Social and Human Sciences of UNESCO. Um, her agenda uh, over at UNESCO has uh, included the achievement of social inclusion and gender equality, advancing youth development, promotion of values through sports, anti-racism and anti-discriminatory anti agenda, and the ethics of artificial intelligence. Prior to her position uh, at UNESCO, uh, Gabriela served as the Chief of Staff and Sherpa to the G20, G7, and APEC in the OECD, contributing to the global agenda as well as leading the OECD's new approach to economic challenges, inclusive growth initiative, gender strategy, and uh, the work on well-being in children. In 2019, she launched the Business for Inclusive uh, Growth platform, uh, bringing together 40 major multinational companies committed to reducing inequalities. Previously, she was director of the OECD office in Mexico and Latin America, and a member of the Mexican Foreign Service. Uh, and uh, just on a personal note, I'll, I'll just mention, uh, Gabrielle has been a close collaborator of the Alan Turing Institute um, for a number of years now, and uh, I've never seen a, a magician like Gabriela. Gabriela was able to, so there's a, a two-year process, right, to, to get the ethics uh, recommendation at UNESCO uh, on AI passed. And somehow, Gabriella got all 193 member states signed on, which was, which was a miracle. So we, we uh, just register appreciation for that. So Gabrielle, please join us on the stage. Well, thank you so much. I, I, I have to say, uh, dear President uh, and David, Cosmina and Baroness, and, and all of you, uh, with that introduction, David, and with this place, you really make us humble. Huh? Uh, but we're very glad to be here with you. I'm, I'm here joined by uh, Irakli Kodeli, who is the deputy of the bioethics in UNESCO, and with James Wright, who is now with UNESCO and was with Alan Turing, but we're very happy to, to have him because at the end, uh, with David, we have really launched a program to push for these technologies to have positive impact in our societies. And you are right. We were yesterday in the UK summit. UNESCO was uh, one of the three institutions that was invited uh, for the summit. Uh, and we were delighted to see how there is a U-turn in the way governments are thinking about these technologies. Because up to two months ago, everybody was considering that you leave the technologies alone. You leave the business sector alone. They're fine. They know better. We don't understand. How can we regulate? How can we 
deal with policies if we don't have a, a clue of how the algorithms work or how the and I have to say that that's being, from my perspective, and I can say it here because this is the academic freedom, neglecting the duties that we have to protect people. And this is something that we have been pushing since we adopted this wonderful piece that I, I, I agree with David, I don't know how we did it. <laughs> but this is uh, the, the recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence uh, that uh, 193 member states uh, adopted. And, um, that also contributed uh, for the U.S. to come back to UNESCO. The U.S. have left UNESCO in 2017, and uh, Secretary Blinken in Congress said we cannot be out of the institution that is globally discussing the rules. So you find a very proud ADG here in front of you. But let me let me tell you that that source of pride is not is not parallel to the sense of concerns that we have. Because, because at the end, we have been listening to this discussion on artificial intelligence as if we need to fix the technologies, as if it is a technological debate, as it is a, no, the question of data, the question of the conceptual frameworks, the question of the fairness and how do we control for the fairness and how we design safety uh, products to uh, deliver from uh, services, when at the end, this is a societal debate. And this is something that we with the Alan Turing Institute have been pushing in terms of how do we think where the society is and what kind of digital transformation we need. What are the problems? What are the issues? And how we can ensure that this technological uh, transformation contribute to solve those problems instead of creating more or exacerbating them. And the place we are in, in the world is not great. Of course, uh, a, a thought to all the people that are suffering from conflicts and, 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 and war, and, uh, but, but a thought for those, all those girls that cannot go to school, a thought for all those violence everywhere. I mean, that's, that's the place we are now. But we are also in a world that is highly unequal. And I think inequalities of income and opportunities that have been growing in the last three decades are informing a, a lot of our societal movement. And there are some facts that are just, just to start the conversation. Uh, the IMF estimates that the richest 10% today owns 76% of wealth, 76% of wealth. And this, you know, as Piketty said, grows faster because the financial sector uh, grows faster and then the, the, the gap is just widening. 52% uh, of all income uh, is also accrued to the 10, top percent. And this is not socially or politically uh, sustainable. If you look at the question of opportunities, at the question of access, at the question of digital infrastructure, and we were talking about the Broadband Commission, again, the distribution of wealth opportunities access is very skewed. And we still have half of the world that is not having access to internet stable connections or mobile telephony, half. And then we wonder why the data sets that fit the, all the uh, uh, developments in these technologies can be uh, skewed or, or biased because they don't represent the diversity of the world and I think this is very important. Then you get into the question of course of, of inclusiveness um, and we know they're not. <laughs> uh, just for the question of gender, no? Uh, we're worried about women not being represented at boards and every time I hear the most advanced economy saying, oh my God, I reached 30% of women in my board. I'm like 30 is not equality. <laughs> Great for you, but 30 at this stage in time is not equality. And we know that in the, in the ITC sector, it's only 18% of women. And then if you go into the business model, it's really dominated by white men from the North. Nothing wrong with that, right? That we have these technological brains, but at the end it's not being inclusive. And I think this is something that we need to consider because there are interventions in the business, in the government, everywhere that you can put to fix this uh, uh, thing. So what we say at, the, at, at UNESCO is that, that these inequalities in the upstream contribute to the inequalities in the downstream. And we're just creating a world with very high concentration of computer capacities, skills, uh, infrastructure, energy, uh, and, and, and of course innovation. And then the rest of the world is not really looking into that. So that's why we are so uh, happy to be here because this is the conversation that the UK is uh, pushing forward with, the, with, the, with Queen Mary for so many years with Alan Turing, but also we saw it with the 20 ministers that were yesterday and now they are with your uh, prime minister 
uh, the conversation has changed. I have to say that a little bit of a push came from the US as usual, uh, because uh, if a President Biden has not give that U-turn, I don't think that we will be where we are, but great. Uh, I, I think there was this, uh, my, my, my DG, when she was celebrating the return of the US to UNESCO in Washington, she said, uh, I'm gonna quote Winston Churchill because the US always takes the right decision after looking at everything else. <laughs> so <laughs> at the, it's great because at the end they're doing what we have been saying for years, ex ante assessments before the developments reach the market with, for you must be like obvious. You will never want a medicine to reach the market if it's not safe. But what is happening in these technologies is that they reach the market, like ChatGPT and all these generative AI. And then we start thinking, what are the impacts? How do we control them? How we, do, are, we are learning when confronting the problems. And I think this needs to change. And this is the message that we got yesterday and that really makes us very, very uh, happy. Uh, we need then to think about the business model and this high concentration. Uh, and also the benefits and the distribution of the benefits. There is this uh, PwC report that estimated that uh, North America and China will greatly benefit from AI with impacts on GDP of 15% in North America, and North America is already still the 20% of the world economy. So it's 15% of the 20% is huge. And then uh, China will win 26% from these uh, technologies while Latin America will only be uh, uh, advancing 5% and Africa and the rest of the world 6%. So even then, in terms of economic um, uh, thinking is important. But then what we did at UNESCO is that these technologies should not be human-centric. They should be planet-centric. Because again, the, the, the assessment of the impact of course, they can contribute a lot to, to solve the environmental problems. And we know in terms of food production, in terms of optimizing, in terms of water management, I mean, it's just huge what these technologies can make. But at the same time, we need to be conscious of the environmental impact. And there are figures that are mind-boggling because uh, all these uh, technologies, for example, uh, between 2021 and 2022, water usage linked to AI development increased 20% and 34% at Google and Microsoft, respectively. So that's huge. I, I don't know if you have heard this uh, um, parallel, because in the case of Microsoft, reaching the equivalent of more than 2,500 Olympic swimming pools. <laughs> that's just amazing. I love this connection, but at the end, these are things that are happening and I feel we need to tackle them, or at least we need to be uh, truthful and look at how do we address the issues. And then uh, we were talking about labor transformations because what we really care about is, is how we benefit those that are more vulnerable. And at the end, we have been also discussing the impact of this technological progress in the labor markets, and, and they are not neutral. And I think there's lots to do to ensure that people with the skills that are going to be automated or that are going to be so transformed that they will not find their way in the labor market are accompanied and support it. And I think this is a very challenging task for institutions like uh, universities, but also for the government, because at the end, uh, it, it is really impacting everything we, we have been doing. There's no longer this question of uh, forming the skills at one time and then let it go. It really needs to be adapting all of the time. And we really need to be looking at how to adapt, uh, uh, adapt this time. How much I have, David? I'm fine? Okay. Um, then the question of um, uh, ChatGPT, generative AI. We, uh, we had some data when I was at the OECD that um, said that probably 40% of the jobs were going to be uh, completely transformed, but uh, almost 80% of the jobs will change and are changing. If you're an architect, if you're an engineer, Mr. President, if you are like us, social scientists, computational social scientists is just amazing. The way we deal with statistics is just completely different. And therefore it's just transforming everything. And therefore, how do we adapt to that? And of course there are, there are those that can adapt and there are those that cannot. 
And we know that, for example, there is this, uh, uh, the stability, the CEO of the stability predicted that almost uh, 5 million coders in India will lose their jobs. Of course, India, it's, uh, the numbers in India are always mind boggling. 5 million not, might not be that much, but at the end, you need to be looking at how do you support that. And then the other side of the coin with the very poorly paid cost workers that you know they're the ones doing the labeling and the, getting the data in the format that needs to be done, uh, very poorly paid. And I think this needs uh, to change. So this is the, the, the scenario and the, and, the, and the real worry is that if left alone, we will have a more unequal world. We will have a more unfair world and therefore is not sustainable and is not good for anybody because at the end what is happening is that we are seeing it. Inequalities of income and opportunities are leading to people being very upset and taking decisions at the political level that might not be the best for our societies in democratic countries. And I think this is really important because everything is linked. And this is something also challenging for, for academic institutions to try to break the, the academic silos and to look not only from the economics perspective, the political perspective, but to have across the board interdisciplinary because everything is linked and we need to, to, to make these connections to understand what are the right uh, solutions. This is a panorama, but we are not powerless. We have been working on that and our message has also been, we can fix it. We can fix it. And yesterday, the, the bitch, uh, uh, my God, I'm very bad at pronouncing names, but the communique of the UK summit, uh, it's, it's super good first step to think about what are the things that we can do together. And what I also like about the message yesterday and the message that I'm hearing here and what we have been working with Alan Turing for so many years is that this is not about the government, this is not about the companies, this is about all of us. The society, bringing the voices of the society to see how we move for a more inclusive uh, technological development. And there we're really proud to be doing uh, a contribution because since the recommendation was approved, it's not that this is a principles of accountability, transparency, explainability, all of those things that of course are the building block of a good governance of the technologies, but we went further than that. We went into looking at the policies, at the tools, at the investments, at the ways we can shape the markets, because we can shape the markets. We can steer the markets. Look at what happened with President Biden adopting these uh, 250 bil uh, million uh, subsidies for companies to go green. Everybody's going green. And then the EU said, oh my God, no. Hold it, because it's going to be taking all of our companies that are doing good things, and, and then they produce our package. So we have the means to do it, and I think that the universities and the way you shape the thinking on these issues, the institutes like Alan Turing have a lot to, a lot to do. Our work at UNESCO is working with member states to find those solutions. And I think this is really important, because it's the governments that have the duty of care, and it's the governments also that need to be thinking how they can invest in themselves. We have been in this mantra that governments should intervene only when there are market failures in the economic thinking, which I think is completely wrong, because at the end, the governments have this duty to protect, and we pay for that. I pay my taxes <laughs> to be protected, and I, I would not like to wait for another financial crisis or COVID crisis for the governments to ship in with $15 trillion because we were not well prepared. And I think that we cannot have another crisis in the AI system. And therefore, the, the big messages that we have been pushing with the recommendation with member states, with a very full developed program working with, the, with member states, is that we need to ensure the rule of law, including effective liability and remediation regimes in cases where AI systems cause harm. And this is the, the, the tenant of democratic uh, uh, countries. At the end, you are not going to be the expert of every single laboratory and every single combination of... No, the government cannot do that. But if there is harm, there is a place where people can go to get redressal. And I think this is very important. It's also very important to ensure competitive markets. And I think we can learn a lot from the trust and competition policies that we have enacted all over the world. Because 
there are rent seekings, and when you have big monopolies, even if it is kind of natural monopoly, and I don't know if you have, if you have some economists in the public, but at the end, natural, natural mon mon monopolies exist. These are the guys that find the first infrastructure, they finance it, they go and they develop the models, and they become a monopoly because there's no one else uh, around. But at the end, you need to reframe the issue because yes, electricity was a monopoly and the telephony was a monopoly and then they stopped being because we applied very strong trust and competition rules. And I think it's about time to think about these uh, very important uh, uh, rules and, and to enact, and this is something we are working with the European Commission that are thinking what kind of institution should we establish to look at these issues. Because is it the Ministry of Digital? Is it the Ministry of Justice? Is it the competition regulator? Is it the, who is in charge of these things? And I think this is an institutional innovation debate that is also super important. Because we are not here telling you what to do. We are here thinking, how do we do it? What is the best model and how we can learn from each other? And you saw yesterday uh, the UK announced the Institute for uh, AI Safety. Uh, the U.S. also launched that. Good, because there will be this reflection. Soon, we will launch a, our observatory on the ethics of AI with Alan Turing, and uh, we're working very closely with the ITU. So we need these answers. We need to move from the description of what can go wrong to the to the tools and the and the and the ways in which we can uh, um, fix the, the wrongdoings. And actually, because that is going to maximize the power of these technologies, it's really going to channel them towards the more difficult areas. The, the second point I mentioned, and the question of human determination, we always hear that, no? And the question is, uh, humans must be in charge, but then you hear the developer saying, no way, I can't, because I don't understand what is this guy doing. At the end, I think that uh, we need to uh, not grant per legal personality to AI developments, and that will at least will protect us from that. And then third, requir requiring inclusive models and outcomes to ensure everybody is represented in the production and deployment of this model. Th these models. This is very important. Uh, we are working to uh, advance this narrative. Uh, we, of course, are in a very uh, inclusive because if you if you are uh, advising you no know, developers, governments to be inclusive in the way they develop the the, the decisions. At UNESCO, we're also, we have a global forum on the ethics of artificial intelligence in Slovenia. We are working, we were in Latin America, and, and we need to make it multi-stakeholder, bring in civil society. We have a business council that is helping us to advance the ethics assessments and, and thinking, uh, co-chaired by Microsoft and Telefonica. So, so I feel that there is this movement, which I feel you are leading also in, in the UK, uh, David, a uh, full force of uh, Alan Turing and also Queen Mary. And, and I feel that we can find the answers together. But again, we need to m make sure that we understand that this is not about the technologies. This is about us. This is about the kind of societies we want to build. Because if you put that lens on, then you will not be caring about whether a, a great mind on the technological front is doing X or Y you will be trying to steer the conversation towards how do we solve the problems and how do we build a more inclusive and sustainable world. And of course, you count on UNESCO and our full force here uh, to keep on shaping this debate together. Thank you so much. Thanks so much, Gabriela. I could listen to that all day. Uh, uh, so we, have, we only have time for maybe a couple questions. So I, I wanted to, to ask you um, first, so you mentioned kind of values-led approaches to governing AI and ex-ante approaches to governing AI. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could tell us uh, what, what types of initiatives and policy actions are part of UNESCO's AI ethics program that so I'm thinking here, maybe impact assessment, things like this, that are really trying to sort of get under that problem? Well, yes, uh, I, I, we, we, we got something that I feel is very important because it's not only the international consensus with the recommendation, but, but we were asked by member states to produce the tools 
to understand where countries are. And I think this is super important because we cannot go there with the vacuum and we cannot go there with a one size fits all. What, what is useful for the UK is not gonna be the same that what is useful for Mexico or for some other countries. So with, uh, again, the support of my dear David, but with the support of a high level group of, of experts from all over the world, we developed the readiness assessment methodology and the ethical impact assessment. And this is to make real the call of having ex ante assessments. And, and, and the readiness assessment is very broad because it's not only about the technological capacities or the infrastructure of the skills, which is a traditional, you remember we did this assessment of what kind of indexes and tools were there in the market. The majority were looking at a, a very small group of countries that they could measure. And then they were only looking at infrastructure, skills, technology. Our readiness assessment is looking at the cultural settings, is looking at societal issues, is looking at government capacities, and, and therefore I feel that we have a very good framework to understand where countries are, but also by responding to these questions that the readiness assessment has, you can also understand what the country wants to do with these technologies, which is a question that is not minor. And, and, and now, uh, we are applying these uh, uh, RAMs, we call it, we need to find a better name because RAMs, but, but the readiness assessment, we are applying to 50 countries all around the world. And the beauty of international institutions, and I have to say international institutions also need to do a better job to, to show that we make meaningful contributions, is that we are going to have comparative knowledge. And we will have, in Latin America, which was the very first round table, that we had of 23 countries in Latin America, 10 of them doing the RAM, they start exchanging, no? In terms of their skills, governance, tools, institutions, that's one of it. The other one, and of course we brought James to, to help us with that, with that work. Uh, the other part is the ethical impact assessment, which is the way we translate the recommendations and the, recommend, uh, the, the recommendations in our international standard into very concrete ethical questions that any developer, any person engaged with these technologies should be doing themselves. You talk about human rights, the recommendation makes this very strong point at the beginning. It should comply with the international framework of human rights. Because when you think only about privacy, that's just one. Then you go to fairness, that's another one. Then you go to abuses, and, and, and there is this whole myriad of human rights, and therefore, this needs to inform the, the thinking of the developers, of the users, of the, and it can change the, instead of saying, how do I optimize? How do I maximize? How do I get the output that I want to get in terms of the objective? How do I define the objective of the system to think, what are the downsides? And how is it going to affect which communities? And how can I ensure that it's not going to cause harm, and, and I feel this is a, a very important tool to, to, to ensure that we, that we uh, push for the right direction. But then we also establish, uh, the, as I said, the Global Forum. We, start, we establish the high-level group of experts that you also are part of, uh, because we need to learn. That this is a fast-moving thinking environment we need to learn. We establish the Women for Ethical AI uh, with Alessandra Sala as a co-chair from Shooter Stock. Uh, and therefore, I think that we have all this infrastructure to move uh, with the implementation. But more than anything, it's, it's beautiful when you learn from those that are in charge of the thing and are looking for the answers, and then they move the thinking, and it's, and it's great. Right, and I think also the com this component that you're talking about of cultural transformation, right? So that it isn't just the kind of optimizing thinking going into it, it's that we need to insert reflective anticipation and critical thinking into each step of, of the development process. Uh, I have one last question for you, which is, uh, so you were just at the summit. I have my own moments of skepticism about the equality agenda and how that agenda might find its way into those round tables. So I'm, I'm just wondering, from your perspective, how do we bring the kind of equity and equality agenda into the mainstream conversations at these AI safety institutes and in these kind of international venues of, of meetings and whatnot? 
That's a super good question because I don't think that this will happen by just repeating and repeating and repeating that this is important. I think that uh, policymakers, and I'm a policy person first and foremost, they are confronted with so many uh, competing objectives. Nobody wants to be behind the technological race. Um, the fact that uh, the leading governments have let uh, the technologies or the companies alone is because they privileged the being at the leading edge, commercial interest, economic interest, geopolitical interest. And that was, let's, let's say it from the political economy, that was the prevailing narrative. Oh yes, I care about people, but oh my God, no, I, I'm losing this competition race, I'm losing this geopolitical race. Uh, and therefore, if you just go there, where these big powers are fighting and don't want to be left behind, and you come and you say, hey, 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 sorry, but there is some issues of uh, inequalities, and they will say, yeah, 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 we'll fix later that, but let me, because you see this is putting moment, and so we are thinking, how do we translate this in a, in a language that is, that is uh, more effective? And the way to do it is to bring the evidence of how unsustainable this model is from the economics perspective. <laughs> and we have the data. Because what is happening is that you have few firms, leading actors, that are sorting out all the skills, all the technologies, all the financial uh, power. And then we say, but why the productivity is flat in our economies? How can it be? If we are at this moment of innovation and our productivity is super flat, it's not flat. The leading firms, the frontier firms, are growing their productivity 5% in services sector and 3% in manufacturing. The rest of the companies are not. So you are leaving, I'm not talking about people, I'm talking about businesses, small, medium, large businesses that are completely out of the game. That's shooting yourself in the foot in the very same language. But then you bring it to the, to the social issues. Because at the end, what you are leaving behind is all of these people that can contribute. And I have some experience on that because when I was at the G20, I wanted to push the gender agenda. And you should have seen, and you, uh, my dear friends, ladies, just you know, tap your ears because it was quite an experience because I arrived and said, why don't we go for a gender agenda in the G20? All of the Sherpas, what are you talking about? That's not for leaders. We're fixing the financial sector, okay? We're fixing the economy. Why are you talking about women? What a strange topic. <gasps> I was like so hurt because I was like, I'm a woman also. And then I started hearing the conversation and everybody, it was 2014 in Australia, everybody was super worried that the economy was not growing even when they have done a lot of economic reforms and the financial reforms, and they were not growing. They were growing at 1%, 1.5 instead of 3%. And then everybody started with, where are the new sources of growth? Where are the new sources of growth? Where are the digital, the digital. And I said, women? <laughs> and I put a paper in front of them, how much the economies will win by reducing the gender gap in the labor for participation and I got 6 percentage point globally. They could not deny that. And we got the gender target. So I think we need to, to look for those evidence that will hit, because, because politicians in democratic countries are not crazy. And if you bring the evidence, I think they will listen. So uh, if you'll join me in, in thanking uh, Gabriella. Well, look, we hear so much um, about the need for global agreements on AI. Uh, so it is wonderful to hear from the one person and the one organization that actually managed to get a global agreement on AI ethics. And I think that in decades from now, students will learn in places like this that UNESCO's recommendation on the ethics of artificial intelligence was the landmark moment that got the global community to turn its attention collectively to AI governance. 
I'm really excited now to introduce you to um, what will undoubtedly be an eye-opening session about AI and children's rights. We have with us today the Baroness Kidron OB, a British filmmaker, crossbench peer in the House of Lords, and an advocate for children's rights in the digital world. She's the founder and chair of Five Rights Foundation, a charity that works to create policy and practical solutions to build the digital world children and young people deserve. In the House of Lords, she sits on the Democracy and Digital Technologies Committee. She's a commissioner for UNESCO's Broadband Commission for Sustainable Development, where she's a member of the Working Group on Child Online Safety. She's also a member of UNICEF's AI Group and sits on IEEE's Council on Extended Intelligence. We also have with us Dr. Vary Aitken, Ethics Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute um, and an Honorary Senior Fellow at the University of Wollongong in Australia. She has been recognized as one of the 100 brilliant women in AI ethics in 2023. Dr. Aitken is passionate about finding creative ways of engaging members of the public in discussions around the roles of data and AI in society. She's a regular performer in the cabaret of Danger Dangerous Ideas at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe and a frequent contributor to media discussions on AI and data. At the Alan Turing Institute, Dr. Aitken leads a program of research focused on engaging with children to explore what they think about AI, how they would like to see AI developed in the future, and how they can be more involved in shaping AI innovation policy and governance. We're so very lucky to have both of you with us today. So we'll hear a, a keynote first uh, from, um, from Baroness Kidron, and then we'll have a panel uh, discussion. And uh, it's a great pleasure to be here, David. This is where it's at. You're absolutely right. Um, and, uh, and a great privilege to follow Gabriella. And although I'm going to talk in slightly different tone, I hope that you see some of the things that you touched upon in the words that, that I wanted, uh, in the things I wanted to say. So at the risk of providing my own spoiler alert, let me start by telling you that I will conclude the great omission that the needs of children are not front and center of the AI summit, but have been quite literally pushed to the fringes. Last Thursday, the Prime Minister set out his great hopes for an AI-enabled world, and he paused to say that he would tackle head-on the potential dangers among the problems he said were coming. He would exploit AI for cyber attacks, disinformation, fraud, or even child sexual abuse. On Monday of this week at a summit fringe event, the Secretary of State, Suella Braverman, National Crime Agency, and the Internet Watch Foundation set out the terrifying scale at which AI-altered and AI-generated child sexual abuse was appearing online. The material that formed the background for this event was in part captured by a covert police unit with whom I've been working uh, for most of this year. Over the last six months, I have seen images, videos, text, voice, and increasingly realistic synthetic environments in which sexual and violent abuse takes on the attributes of gaming in worlds where distorted appetites and imagination without a single real-world limitation creates material of such depravity that even after a decade of engaging with this material, I have been shocked to the core. Now, I do not want to give the impression that the relationship between AI and children is confined to the question of child sexual abuse. Absolutely not, as I will come to very shortly. But I do want to forcibly make the point that AI-generated child sexual abuse is not, as the Prime Minister suggested, a problem of the future. It is a problem of the here and now. Creation, distribution, consumption of CSEA content are illegal in the UK, albeit covered by at least three separate laws, the oldest of which 
uh, is from 1978. But the models or plugins trained on and specializing in the creation of CSA built on, are built on readily available image text and video creation are not illegal right now. There is undoubtedly an argument for a new bill to bring together and update all the legislation that touches on this issue. But um, at a minimum, we could use legislation currently going through Parliament to update definitions and plug the gaps to create the necessary friction for those who profit, create, and consume CSA, including informed consent for the use of images in training models so that a child's image cannot be scraped from social media or a school website and turned into abuse material, and making it an offense to train models on CSAM, a here and now problem, not a problem that needs to be left to the fringes. The reason that I'm setting this out in such detail is that in a week of existential angst, it offers three really important lessons. First, we have laws in many of the areas of that are causing concern. So before raising the alarm about existential threat of the future, it would seem prudent to look at the present and see how our existing rights and laws do apply, or indeed could apply, um, if we chose to do so. I've just applied this thought to the CSA context, but how about intellectual property, data protection rights, collective bargaining as the Hollywood writers have just done, consumer rights, safety standards, human rights, children rights, and so on. The routine application and robust enforcement of these existing legal and rights frameworks would radically change the way in which AI is being developed and deployed. Second, the language we use is critical. The language of existential threat that AI will replace humans is something that disempowers most of us. But ask us if we want to supercharge the creation of child sexual abuse material, I'm hazarding a guess, the answer is no. Or if we think it's okay to have facial recognition trained on white faces so a black head teacher, visitor, parent, child cannot pass the security to enter the school, again, no. Or, um, we have language that provides for shared human values and that language gives us agency. Existential threat gives us none. And I will leave to another contributor the task of considering if AI is either artificial or intelligent, but whether computational systems, however powerful, have agency without the human systems that give them free reign, I am willing to challenge. Nuclear, biological weapons, disease contagion, or even climate change all have the capacity to bring the world as we know it to an end. On the first two, the global community curtailed both development and spread to a degree of success that has, at a minimum, prevented global annihilation. The pandemic saw the human agency at scale as every part of the world moved to contain the virus. And perhaps climate change is simultaneously the best and worst example in that we see a struggle for human agency over vested interests in which enormous equity disparities between polluters and polluted, between the natural world that provides oxygen, human behavior that gobbles it up, between the short-term politicians and businesses and the longer-term interests of the young. This battle in full swing offers us a glimpse of how it is possible to make a question so big that it creates an environment in which the immediate and practical actions that might really contain the threat are overlooked in favor of an as yet unidentified silver bullet that will save us when the time comes. AI is not separate and different, and the language we use to describe it, e either its benefits or threat, must make that clear. 
AI is built, used, and pervaded by business, government, civil society, and as, a, as I've already pointed out, criminals. It is part of human-built systems over which we still have agency. Who owns the AI, who benefits, who's responsible, who gets hurt, is at this point still in question. The language that suggests AI is too late and too difficult for us to deal with is in fact a carryover of decades of a deliberate strategy of tech exceptionalism that has privatized the wealth of technology and outsourced the cost to society. Existential threat is the language of tech exceptionalism and it is tech exceptionalism that poses a threat to humanity, not the technology itself. Thirdly and finally, children are early adopters of technology. The canaries in the coal mine, as we've seen in social media, gaming, and other carelessly developed and poorly regulated digital environments. The AI debate should start with children, not push them to the fringe. Children have no electoral capital, so need representation. They have an enhanced set of rights, so there are more strings to pull. They are likely to live longer, so the impact of automated decisions will have a longer lifespan. And the disciplines, ideological, geographic, cultural, socioeconomic groupings have a vested interest in making life okay for their child or children in general. AI in EdTech is already such a problem that UNESCO recently published a 500-page book, The EdTech Tragedy, that forensically points out the failure to ask basic questions about the quality of outcomes for children, social, developmental, and educational, before creating an EdTech market that is cannibalizing the education system across the world. AI in recruitment, routinely untrustworthy on the base of race and gender, but more subtly has taken out human agency from a process that could, if human judgment was applied, provide a leap for young people without the right qualifications. And I know what that human agency means because I am one such child, or was. Policing, the distribution of welfare, alg algorithmically targeting three and four year olds because they click more often on advertising links than other demographics. Where AI has been adopted, undermining human agency, impacting on children here and now. Not because tech is bad, but because it is primarily deployed on the promise of efficiency without sufficient care for pedagogy, diversity, non-computational qualities, children's rights, or their development needs. In the race for AI prominence and the vast riches that they envisage, the tech bros have come to town to warn us that the future they are creating is untrammeled, unprincipled, and insecure whilst loudly proclaiming that society must get a grip. Meanwhile, in the race to be the one, they are failing to apply existing rules about privacy, intellectual property, children's rights, or safety rails to their models. And it's not even on the table that they become corporately or personally responsible for the outcomes of AI, even as they seek to monetize the benefits. With wars raging across the world with no glo global consensus to bring them to an end, with elections pending with the widespread use of mis- and disinformation anticipated, with an ever-growing uh, 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 gap of e equity across regions and the very survival of the planet in plain sight, it would be beyond foolish to stand here and suggest that I have the answer for the development of secure, enabling, trustworthy AI. But technology is largely neutral and human agency is not. And 
if we wish to build the digital world that children deserve, we must bring to an end the existential threat of tech exceptionalism and reverse the failure of governments, most worryingly in the, in the US, to imply enforceable standards to the tech sector as it does to other sectors. To ensure that AI is developed for the benefit of all, including children across the globe. Thank you. So much, Baroness Keatron. Um, that was an amazing, amazing, uh, amazing speech. Um, and I really agree with the reflections on you know, the AI Safety Summit and it's the, the emphasis on existential threat, where children are really only being mentioned as children of the distant future rather than the children of, of here and now. Um, I was going to start by asking you uh, what your expectations were of how the, the AI Safety Summit might address children, uh, but you <laughs> pretty clearly set out that maybe. Maybe not so much, but what would be your hopes have been uh, had the summit perhaps included a different set of voices? Well, I, I think there's a widespread feeling that the summit's agenda was, you know, towards putting, putting the UK in the conversation rather than dealing with these fundamental questions about how we wanted that to be. So I think there's a, a widespread disappointment. I did go and hear uh, Kamala Harris at the, the embassy yesterday, and uh, she did make a good speech, and I, I was very interested to, her, to hear from, a, from the US's vice president the word regulation. You know, if you don't do this, we will regulate you. Now, you know, having spent some time in America, seeing how they are uh, trying to... Uh, adopt regulation that we've already had here for a couple of years, um, you know, I don't hold up a great deal of hope. But I, I, I honestly do think, as Gabriella said, and I, I tried to indicate, we're starting with the wrong question. Yeah. Um, just a reminder to anybody who's uh, watching online and want to add questions onto Slido, um, please do and remember that the, ha the hashtag, uh, hashtag AI fringe to add questions via, via Slido. Um, I also wanted to ask about, I mean, there's often an emphasis on um, protecting children from online harms or from algorithmic harms, which is obviously a really important priority. Um, but I was wondering for your views on how we balance, say, protecting children from algorithmic harms, harms of AI systems, with also the need to empower children to make informed decisions or to benefit from those technologies. Um, I'd really interested to hear your thoughts on kind of how we make that, that, that balance between these two, two goals. No, and I, and I think it's, I mean, it, it is hugely important and, you know, uh, I think in the, on the panel in a minute is going to be Professor Sonia Livingston and we work together on the DFC, which is the Digital Futures Commission, and, and look very much at, at how to, you know, look at the participation rights of children as well. But I, I think just specifically in the question of AI, so much of what is happening is, is hidden from the person to whom it is happening. And also, when we talk about it, we so often talk about it as something happening to an individual, but actually it's happening to groups and communities and relationships. And so it's sort of this invisible thread. So I think that, that my answer is, you know, we can't responsibilize children to identify things that are problems for them, but that actually if it is a more equitable uh, technology, then absolutely they should be using it, you know, to, for, for their, their entertainment interests, their civic interests, their relationships, and so on and so on. And so I think we do get a bit stuck on protection, but that's because we're trying to stop certain developments um, going in a particular way. And I think that, that for most of my sort of political life on this issue, um, I haven't really been looking at protection. I've been looking at rights, and I've been looking at the lack of equity, you know, that children have in this space because their development um, capabilities are not even on the on the table. I mean, when when I first started talking about this, you know, the the, the there was an absolute acceptance that children would be adult online at 13. That was the only operating <laughs> model. And uh, uh, that actually 
that was and that and the companies didn't have to check if they were even 13 so that meant however old you were you were treated as adult and and mm -hmm. life offline isn't like that and children need you know uh, stages and and many of them will involve risk and upset but we're not what i'm talking about is whether it's okay to scrape a kid's profile off yeah. a school website and then make them a sexual object or indeed if it's okay to you know make three-year-olds you know bash at advertising links not yeah. for me <laughs> yeah, absolutely we've got time for one more question there's a question here on the slido um it says what will what roles do schools have in helping ensure children's rights in an ai enabled world I, I think it's a great question and i think it is a difficult question i mean uh, you know through my adult life i have seen schools become the front line um for so many issues you know uh whether whether it is you know hung, hung beyond education you know whether it's hunger or safety and and so on and i think that you know schools should try and understand uh the experience that young people are having and i think they should talk to the young people and <laughs> and hear their explain uh, their, their their experience and perhaps not jump so quickly to explaining what they think their experience is a lot of young people say that you know we have a very low tolerance to being told about social media by people who don't use it um you know uh i think so i think there's something about understanding the collective experience i do think that schools should have rules um, about how they use it but i would suggest that they get the young people the children to create co-create those rules so that they are something that they buy into um, and, and I do think uh, that, that, that they should be looking to use technology in collective ways, because I'm really worried about the way that it's kind of one pupil, one, one computer, yeah. and actually so much of learning is between people. Um, and, and so there are things like that. But, but my real message is we've got to keep the companies to account. And the reason that I wanted to raise EdTech today uh, which is another uh, area where Sonia and I have been very interested uh, over a number of years, is uh, that's an uh, unobserved, silent takeover of something which was largely seen or largely constituted as a, a social good all around the world and now is being radically privatized. And you know, go try find the peer reviews of all that technology that they're using in school. We couldn't find it, so please, please do let us know if you do. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, sadly, that's uh, we're, we're out of time. I think we could we could discuss this all day, <laughs> which I would love to. Um, but we'll have to, to move on to our next panel session. Um, please join me in, in uh, a round of applause and saying thank you to, to Baroness Kidron. Right. And I'd like to move us on to our, our first uh, panel session of the day uh, on this on the subject of oh sorry <laughs> on the subject of uh, uh, children's rights and AI and particularly on child-centered approaches to addressing AI. Um, I'd like to invite our panel up onto the stage. We have um, Sonia Livingston. Sorry, I'm far too many pieces of paper here. <laughs> Sonia Livingston from London School of, of Economics. Um, Stephen Vosloo joins us online from UNICEF. Um, Lorleen Perugia from, uh, uh, from, uh, AI, from A1 uh, Research and Alicia Aurora from Hope Sisters. And I'm really delighted to, to introduce this, this, channel, uh, this um, panel where we're going to be discussing child-centered approaches to AI, which is a, a real passion of mine um, and is a really important area of work within the ethics team at the Public Policy Programme of the Alan Turing Institute. Um, this is a, a growing area of, of research for us um, where we're working on both trying to understand the existing kind of governance frameworks and regulatory legislative um, landscape around children's rights and AI, but also developing approaches to child-centered AI, in particular through a collaboration with the Scottish AI Alliance and Children's Parliament, where we've been working over a two-year period with primary school children across Scotland. Um, and I'm really delighted today to have really a, a, an amazing panel of uh, such incredible expertise and experience in this field um, to discuss how we can advance child-centered AI. Um, let me just grab my slide. -o. 
Okay, so I'm going to introduce each of the panel members one by one as we ask the, the first question. Um, and Stephen, I'm going to come to you first. Can you, can you see and hear us okay, Stephen? Yes, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Yeah, we can hear you. That's great. I have missed one of my many pieces of paper. So sorry. <laughs> So I'm delighted to introduce Stephen Russo from uh, UNICEF Innocenti. Stephen is t uh, Technology Policy and Innovation Specialist at UNICEF Innocenti uh, Global Office of Research and Foresight. And Stephen works at the interse intersection of children, emerging tech and policy, covering issues such as children and AI, digital disinformation, the metaverse, newer technology, and digital, e digital equality, which is quite a, a number of um, hefty topics. Um, so, Stephen, I want to start with the first question to you. Um, we're starting with, what does child-centered AI mean to you? Um, but then leading on from that, what have been the biggest successes in your work so far for advancing child-centered AI? Well, firstly, thank you very much for this opportunity. It really is an honor to speak here um, with colleagues um, on the panel. Hi, Sandra. Hi, Alicia. Um, and also to speak after Gabriella and Beban. Both excellent, excellent interventions. Um, so, child-centered AI really means prioritizing the needs and opportunities of children at the heart of AI policy and regulation and AI system. And here, when we talk about AI systems, it's the full life cycle, um, which I know most people in the, in, in the room here understand, but, you know, the design, the develop, the deploy, and, and even the sunset. So, I wanted to just point out, and really building on what, what Beban said, um, children are not just small adults. They have rights in addition to the human rights that they enjoy and we all enjoy. Um, they are biologically and psychologically distinct from adults and are differently impacted by AI systems. So they use the apps and services in, in unanticipated ways. They have different perspectives and a lot of the research that Sonia and UNICEF has done unpacks that, that they think differently about privacy or about security. Um, there are early adopters, as Biba noted, uh, Sonia and UNICEF's research from many years ago now had pointed out that even back then, one third of all online users are children. And in developing countries, we know this, higher, this number is higher. So um, we're not talking about a minority group here. We often, you know, they often talk about children, vulnerable groups, minority groups. This is a significant user group. So the child-centered AI really means recognizing these unique characteristics, these development stages. Um, and at the moment, we don't do that. So AI systems that children use and that impact them are not designed for them, and the policies don't actually address this. Um, so in terms of successes, you know, what Gabriella said, the policymakers they kind of have a fatigue. We don't want to burden them with new um, new kind of requirements if we don't need to. In terms of successes that we've had at UNICEF and, and as we developed the first UN policy guidance on AI for children, working with many of the, the folks here, um, was not to reinvent the wheel, just to shine a spotlight on children. So what does explainability mean for children? What does data protection and privacy mean for children? And that was really powerful because it wasn't adding a new AI principles. It was helping policymakers to think through existing principles, but how they apply them to this user group. Um, and then really just engaging with children in the process. So I'm a huge fan of the work that you're doing with the Scottish Parliament and um, the Scottish AI Alliance on engaging children. We did the same, as you know, and it was hugely, hugely um, impactful for us. So I'll just close to say, if we can highlight the child user and provide concrete support for how AI policies and systems can empower, not just protect, empower and protect them, that is key to more child-centered AI. Yeah. Thank you, Stephen, that's amazing. Um, I'm gonna to come to you next, Sonia. Uh, so Professor Sonia Livingston is a full professor in the Department of Media and Communications at London School of Economics and Political Science. Sonia has published 20 books on uh, media audiences, children, and young people's risks and opportunities, media literacy and rights in the digital environment. Sonia directs the Digital Futures for Children Research Center at LSE and Five Rights Foundation, uh, as well as Global Kids Online with UNICEF. Um, so Sonia, I want to start with the, 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 the same starting bit of the question I asked it to Stephen, which is what does child-centered AI mean to you? Um, but then particularly, what role um, can child rights by design play in translating child-centered AI approaches into practice? 
Um, thank you so much, and thank you for um, including me on the panel. I just want to say that I'm um, actually announcing the centre that I'm working on with Five Rights Foundation for Digital Futures for Children is new. And we are just really um, you know, listening very carefully, but also wanting to kind of um, make sure that children fit within an agenda about technology and innovation that is happening very fast. Um, and as Steve said, you know, just really keeping in mind, children are one in three of the population, and so many events, dare I say this one included, does not have child participation and a way of including um, the voices of, of children and young people, though I know that many people here, or I hope that some people here will be um, consulting children, as is their right um, in, in um, playing a part in shaping um, their, their digital environment, the digital environment. Um, in the Digital Futures Commission and in our work going forward, we've been working really with the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child as our, as our kind of framework, as our mandate, as our kind of guiding vision. And um, I, I suspect, though I don't know that many people designing products and policies for the digital world don't know what it says, um, I would like to encourage them to go and recognize how um, children's rights is the right to protection, but also the right to participation in and through digital media, di the digital environment. Um, it's the right to be heard about how that digital environment is shaped. And it's all the human rights that apply to everybody, plus the right to have their fullest development respected, to have their best interests as a primary um, consideration, to have the right to play, to have the right to information, a whole host. You know, so it is holistic, it is demanding, and we're, we're demanding something on behalf of children that is very uh, challenging, which is not just that high-level policymakers, as it were, play lip service to children's rights, but, the, but their rights are heard and embedded in every step of the process of designing and developing products and services that impact them. And if I can just add one kind of key point about impact them. I think sometimes when people um, talk about the role of children in relation to digital technologies, they think of the technologies designed for children, toys, um, maybe ed tech, actually not enough ed tech that's thought of as a service for schools and teachers. Um, but there's a host of ways in which the digital environment really um, makes a difference to an impact on children's rights when children are not necessarily the users, when children are not necessarily the intended users. Designing health systems, designing um, data systems, designing um, uh, learning systems that are thought of for the school but actually for um, impacting on, on children. Uh, consumer products of all kinds um, that children use, that children are there. And I think, you know, child rights by design is really um, a way of trying to recognize a holistic, significant set of rights that apply to one in third of the population in some places, more, um, that goes right through the process of thinking. So when we come to innovation, we come to AI, we come to something moving really fast, it's more important that children are at the forefront of our minds rather than something to be kind of deferred as an afterthought, we'll get there later. Absolutely. Uh, okay, Lorraine, I'm going to come to you next. Uh, so, uh, Lorraine, Lorraine Fruger, um is the head of research at A1 Research, um, where she has dedicated the last 12 years to research in child centre strategies for addressing online risks. Uh, Lorraine has a, a background in development, evaluation and impact assessment, and has collaborated with uh, numerous international organisations to advance child-centred approaches for advocacy and evidence-based in interventions to address online risks. Um, in addition to her research work, Lorraine also lectures at University of Malta in research methodology, critical psychology and the interdisciplinary area of children, youth and media. And in the past few years, Lorraine's work has been focusing on the intersection of children's rights and latest advancements in AI. Um, so I also want to ask you, Lorraine, what, what child-centered AI means to you, um, but particularly in relation to your, to your research around online safety, how might child-centered approaches complement emerging regulation in this area? Thank you. Thank you for, for the invitation. Um, so in terms of when I, when I think of child-centered AI, um, very often um, we think of children as uh, one group of, of people. Um, with uh, in, in most often in, in various situations they are excluded from the conversation as we've been saying but we also need to look into 
the diversities um, of children's experiences and also backgrounds, thinking of um, uh, in terms of um, age, gender, um, uh, thinking of context. Uh, sometimes um, we, we try, we, we, we are still looking at situations where in, in, some, in some instance, children are struggling with access to digital technologies and, and perhaps um, digital skills. So kind of, um, when we speak of children, we have to consider this, these diversities, these multiplicities of, of experiences in terms of, um, in terms of their relationship with technologies. And of course, um, in terms of, of online safety then, um, I, I've been saying this for a couple of years, there's um, a lot of potential in technology itself um, to help uh, children learn and manage online safety. So kind of instead of um, online safety being uh, an afterthought or, or something that we think about um, when, when things go wrong and they say, oh, we need to address this. But let's, let's try and figure out how technologies itself themselves can be used to, to support children with um, engaging in a conversation about technology. Children have a lot to say about technology. Even It's very evident even when you carry out research with children. And this is another responsibility I think that we have as researchers to um, include the multiple perspectives of children in the research process itself, especially thinking about if these data sets are then going to be used uh, it, to train AI systems, keeping in mind that obviously these systems will reproduce the biases that exist already and perhaps even amplify them. So thinking about um, how we have the responsibility to ensure the voices of really all children are included and, and not just um, the most accessible ones to us because I find that sometimes as researchers perhaps this is um, a struggle that we face that children um, uh, want to want to or at least they as i said they have a lot of to say about technology and and quite often they ask if this conversation is going to happen multiple times when they are participating in research but uh, very often we we um, struggle to access um, the diversities of, of childhood in in the research process as well yeah um i'm gonna last but certainly not least i'm coming to alicia uh, Alicia Aroa serves as a, a UNICEF youth, youth ambassador for mental health, mental health and AI, working on AI initiatives to detect suicidal ideation with support from Microsoft, Microsoft and MIT re researcher and a member of World Economic Forum's AI Council. Uh, Alicia founded the Hope Sisters, which is a non-profit organization dedicated to spreading hope. Um, and her efforts have, been, have recognized her as one of Canada's top 100 most powerful women, which I think at the age of 17, we can all agree is, is really quite, <laughs> quite something, really, really impressive. Um, Alicia, I also want to ask you um, for your view on what child-centered AI means to you. Um, and also perhaps give you the slightly uh, uh, onerous task of representing a, a, youth, a youth voice <laughs> and a youth perspective on, on this panel. Um, I know there's often a lot of misconceptions around children's relationships with AI or what children know about AI or care about AI. Um, and I'd be really, really interested to hear from your perspective, what are kind of the biggest misconceptions around children and AI and how does that relate to or, or perhaps challenge uh, advancing child-centered approaches? Well, thank you so much, and it's such an honor to be here and represent young people. Um, I think that's a great question, and as you said it, you know, child-centered AI, I think it says it right there, child. And it's, it's so important when we talk about something like engaging young people in this conversation, we engage them. And I think, you know, when we talk about the misconception, misconceptions, as you mentioned, I think one of the biggest ones that come to my mind is, you know, despite young people being so involved in the digital world, I think we are digital natives, we are on our phones, we're on social media, we're known for that. But I think that that doesn't really correlate to our knowledge and digital literacy in the space of AI. And I think that is one of the biggest misconceptions that adults think is that, oh, they know that they're giving their privacy away and their data is being, um, you know, breached and that, um, they're willingly allowing all these dangers and you know impact on, onto themselves. But the truth is, and even if I go to my classes and, and you know my final year of high school, um, if I would go walk into my class and ask how many young people in my in the room knew about AI and, and you know the dangers and how it's impacting their day-to-day -day lives, um, 
and there would not be many young people who would who would really know that. So I think, you know, with that, one of the biggest things is educating and educating young people on this because if they know and if they're self-aware, then maybe we can move on to including them and in also working towards and, and for them for themselves to work towards making it better. But I think the second part of this, and I think when it comes to another misconception is possibly that young people do want to be involved and in this space and in this conversation. I should not be the only young person here to speak about what it, you know, what it means for AI safety because I'm only one voice. And I think they're young people Oftentimes we have adults making decisions for us, but it's so important that young people are at the conversation and are at the table as well. And then I think finally, you know, you know, I think there's educating, there's engaging, but then finally also empowering and empowering young people to, you know, not just see AI as a tool because obviously there are their dangers. And it is, it, you know, the, the impact can be quite, quite awful. But I think AI itself is just a tool, but, you know, whose hands the tool is in is probably what the problem is. And, you know, AI can be used as a tool for positive change. But I think if we have the education and we have young people involved, then maybe, and just maybe, it could be used for a tool for it to make some great change. So, yeah. Absolutely. Thank you. Um, we now have a, a video. We, we, um, uh, we invited uh, um, ICT Africa to contribute to this panel. Unfortunately, we're not able to, to join the panel today, but have sent in a video to uh, provide their answer to what child-centered AI means in an AI context. I'm hoping if I play this now, uh, can we have the, get the video on the screen? An African think tank called Research ICT Africa. It is an immense honor to be a part of the Global AI Safety Summit. And today I'll be speaking about what child-centered AI means in the African context. Notably, a considerable portion of our time is now immersed in digital environments and interactions. The internet and smart devices have become deeply integrated into the lives of African children. With these realms becoming increasingly intertwined, it's becoming more imperative to promptly examine the nature of children's experiences and how the design of the digital world impacts them. Central to the digital world is artificial intelligence. Children around the world use their access to technology in a multitude of ways, for leisure to socialize and play, as well as for educational purposes. This shift provides new opportunities, not only for reimagining educational and interactive aspects, but also risks the immersion of children into digital environments that are designed to meet the commercial objectives of private companies. Child-centered AI in the African context refers to the development and implementation of AI technologies and systems that prioritize the well-being, needs, and rights of children on the African continent. This approach takes into consideration the unique socio-cultural, economic, and technological context of African countries, as well as the specific challenges and opportunities faced by African children. Child-centered AI in the African context is about harnessing the potential of AI to address the specific needs and challenges faced by children on the African continent, ultimately aiming to improve their well-being, access to opportunities, and overall quality of life. It requires a holistic and inclusive approach that considers the diverse and unique circumstances of African children. The following are two key aspects of how child-centered AI can be implemented in the African context. Firstly, Child-centered AI in Africa should be designed to include and benefit all children, regardless of their socioeconomic background, location, or access to technology. It should aim to bridge the digital divide and ensure that AI solutions reach children in both urban and rural areas. AI systems should respect and reflect the diverse cultures, languages, and traditions of African societies. This includes language support, content that is culturally relevant and appropriate, as well as understanding the contextual nuances of African children's lives. And finally, child-centered AI should prioritize the safety and well-being of African children, including protection against online risks and harms. These risks and harms include protecting children from online abuse, cyberbullying, and harmful content. Additionally, we need to ensure that children's data is handled with care and that their privacy is respected. 
AI developers should adhere to strong ethical guidelines and privacy protections when creating AI solutions for children in Africa. And with that, I will end there. Thank you so much for your time and enjoy the rest of the summit. Hello. My key takeaways to the attendees of a global AI safety summit would be with key policies and sources on AI guidance that are focused on AI and children, pointing out the protection of children at all costs. I think it is quite essential to ensure and encourage that children get to learn with AI and get to learn about AI so that they may be able to navigate and are well equipped to navigate a society that's really moving into AI, a society that's AI driven and a society that's integrating AI in various sectors. However, this encouragement of this immersion into an AI world should be guided by the following. One, should really be guided by real evidence of the potential harms and risks that these technologies pose to children. Two, it should be guided by children's voices where they are given an opportunity to express what they think, express what they feel about these technologies and the integration of these technologies into various aspects of their lives, play, social interaction and education. And lastly, it should be guided by a deep understanding of the various contexts and the various worlds that children exist in. Only once when we have done this is when we can truly say that we have curated real solutions to the potential risks and harms that these technologies pose to children. And only once when we have truly done this is when we can then say that we have put the best interest of a child at the epicenter. Thank you. Um, I know we are very rapidly running out of time. I want to just ask each of our panel members just for some closing reflections on what would be the, the key takeaways uh, for what, what the, the people who are meeting at, at Bletchley Park at the Global AI Summit, uh, message to world leaders, to uh, senior decision makers around policy and regulation. If I could ask you each for kind of a, a very brief final takeaway message of what are the, the key messages that need to be uh, on the table being addressed around uh, children and AI. Stephen, I'm gonna to come to you first. Sure. So I, I was going to say what the, the previous speaker just said, which was excellent about engaging children. Um, but maybe, maybe just to kind of pivot quickly, it's not just about participation as a right, uh, which it is. And it seems crazy that we still keep having this conversation that children need to be at the table. Um, but maybe the idea is, and building on Gabriella's point, not the economic side, but children bring really good ideas and bring perspectives that the adults in the room do not see. And if we're dealing with the technology that they're using and that it will impact them for the rest of their lives, those perspectives may actually result, and we propose that they will result in much better AI governance structures. Thank you. Great, thank you. And Sonia, what's your, your takeaway message? Um, I, I think it will be um, to the adults in the room and in the conversation, don't be scared. Um, and that might sound patronizing and weird, but um, I just hear a lot of kind of hidden fear about addressing children. Children are specialists, children are difficult, children are not here, we don't quite know how to talk about, we don't know. There's so much practical guidance produced by, you know, um, Steve and his colleagues at UNICEF, by Five Rights, by, by a number of specialist organizations that are making it very practical to include children and to address children's rights um, in this debate. It's just a matter of kind of opening that door and recognizing it. And Lolin. Yes, so I think um, it, in terms of um, a key takeaway, I would say let's um, consider the possibility that we have to not fail another generation in terms of, um, I think we've been, uh, where there were situations where we've been a bit short-sighted in the past when it comes to children and the internet, and um, we have an opportunity to be proactive at this stage, so kind of uh, thinking of uh, when a child is harmed by something that they come across online, that harm remains with a child for a very long time. And we can think of like the example of social media and fines to industry, they function up to a certain extent because they won't undo the, the damage that has been done to the child. So we need to keep that in mind and make sure to regulate to ensure that the systems that we build are safe, really safe for children. And Alicia, the last word goes to you. What's your takeaway message? Um, yeah, I think that 
one of my biggest takeaways would be that every single person has a role to play. You know, parents, educators, you know, companies. I think it's time that they stop maximizing the profits and start maximizing welfare and well-being of young people. It's time that governments are holding them accountable. And then I think, you know, to everyone's point, it's time that young people are also included in that conversation. And I think we've, we, you know, there are risks also to AI and there are dangers that need to be held accountable for. But it's also time that we spread awareness about the the positive change and the change that we can make. So, uh, yeah, I think that would be all. Okay, that's and what a brilliant end, a brilliant note to end on. A real uh, call to action there, which is yes, an area that, that we uh, will continue to be working on at the Alan Turing Institute and hopefully through through collaborations with all of us here on, on the panel. Um, please uh, give a warm uh, round of applause and thank you to our, our excellent panel of speakers. Thank you. Excellent. What an inspiring session, like laying out a way to think about the future in a way that I think all of us can get behind. We'll shift gears a little bit and move on from bringing children into discussions on AI to thinking about the communities left behind in the AI race. And for that, we have with us today Dr. Mike Cattell, Ethics Fellow at the Alan Turing Institute and a visiting senior lecturer at the Digital Environment Research Institute here at Queen Mary University of London. Dr. Cattell is a technology policy scholar and a philosopher of technology whose research focuses on the social justice and human rights implications of data and digital infrastructure. He is also a co-director of the Critical Platform Studies Group, an independent research collective whose work focuses on surfacing structures of power and domination reflected in technology-related research practices and in the production and allocation of information goods. Please welcome Dr. Mike Cattell. Hello, good day, good day. Um, thank you very much, Cosmina, for that introduction. Um, and thank you to everyone who for being here. Uh, this is an exciting time. Um, the topic of, the, of this next panel is global data justice and generative AI. So just a little bit of background. Two years ago in 2021, the Alan Turing Institute began a project called Advancing Data Justice Research and Practice. We sought to expand on prior academic work which had laid the groundwork for the study of data justice by joining together social justice research, including decolonial studies, gender studies, critical theory, with socio-technical investigations of data-driven technologies, infrastructures, and practices. In our project, we sought to decenter the global north Eurocentric westernized perspective to ask who is not being heard in crucial arenas of policy and decision making uh, being made about AI. And also asking the question, what does this idea of data justice mean to these people who are not being heard, who are left out of these conversations? And then finally, we asked the question of when, meaning how do geopolitical histories and legacies set the stage for the present and the future of people feeling the greatest effects on their lives and well-being from AI and digital infrastructures? This line of inquiry led us to a partner with 12 community organizations across the globe who enriched our understanding of these questions through their consultations with local communities and the invaluable valuable feedback they provided for our work. The project has been enlightening and fruitful. To date, we've produced three data justice and practice guides. This was accompanied by an annotated bibliography and a repository of data justice stories. We've also produced three full-length data justice documentaries, 11 animated shorts, and we're working on a forthcoming special issue uh, of articles about data justice for the academic journal AI and Society. This is very exciting times. And so today's panel, we want to take this conversation a bit further, and we'll be discussing data justice through the lens of the turn to generative AI, seeking to go beyond the hype 
and the tech billionaire worldview to ask how the Gen AI, uh, how the Gen AI moment affects everyone, including uh, people who are most at risk from issues of extractivism and exploitation. So please join me in welcoming the panelists to the stage. I'd like to uh, introduce, start by introducing all each of the panelists, and then I'll direct some questions to them. Um, just to remind you that we uh, are taking questions on Slido. Uh, use the hashtag AIFringe, and we will try to get to at least a few uh, audience and remote questions. So um, sitting right here, second away from me, is Dr. Andres Dominguez Hernandez, who is an ethics fellow at the Alan Turing Institute. His research examines questions of power and empowerment, responsibility, and justice in relation to technological innovation. Prior to his academic work, Andres was director of technology transfer at the Ecuador Ministry of Science, Technology, and Innovation, and he has also worked as a practitioner in the design and implementation of internet infrastructure. Joining us on screen, Dr. Angeline Orengi is a, Orengi, sorry, is a senior research fellow uh, at the Center for Intellectual Property and Information Technology Law at Strathmore University in Nairobi. She is interested in the means by which we can leverage science and technology to develop solutions to the most challenging problems facing the African continent. She is particularly interested in the intersectional impacts of emerging technologies, data and policy in Africa, with a particular focus on climate and energy related issues and the gendered impact of emerging technology on the African continent. And seated on the end, hello, Ajna Kalamera is a program manager at CIPESA, where she coordinates multi-country projects promoting the use of ICT in democratic processes and for citizen participation, including training for citizen journalists, mainstream media, and government officials. She holds an MSc in informatics with a major in electronic government from Obrera University in Sweden and a BSc in computer management, uh, uh, sorry, computer and management sciences from the University of Warwick here in the United Kingdom. She has worked, experience in Spain, the UK, and various African countries. And seated to my left, Dr. Sham Krishna is a postdoctoral researcher stewarding the Advancing Data Justice Project at the Alan Turing Institute. Uh, Sham is an engineer turned ethicist he researches emergent technologies and their societal implications through a lens of social justice. His research includes the study of algorithmic labor practices in the gig economy, digital inclusion under biometric and data infrastructure, and most recently, querying the socio-cultural foundations of generative AI. Um, I'd like to begin, Sham, by directing a question to you. You've been looking closely at the ecosystems and infrastructures that enable Gen AI and are in turn affected by it. What have you learned from this about the wider effects of Gen AI on the social world? Thank you. Thank you, Mike. I'd, I'd like to position that uh, data justice, uh, the project itself, we learned widely from our 12 Global South partners, uh, including uh, CIPESA and CIPIT who are re represented here. Uh, in the generative AI era, what's missing is the conversation of what's being done ground up and not coming from you know, people in the uh, main uh, summit, I want to say, who are not necessarily representative of the global uh, populace, who are necessarily the impacted communities for uh, generative AI. I like to bring in uh, one example of uh, how I analyze this. I like to call it the bunny versus the squirrel problem. If you go to any imaging, uh, you know, generative AI imaging site, look for a child with a bunny and a child uh, with a squirrel. The squirrel is not going to look like anything you've seen on Earth. And I did that because I had a pet squirrel growing up, and I, I was interested in why uh, this was. You do reverse searching, uh, and you can see that there is thousands of, uh, I'm supposed, billions of images of bunnies. Uh, they are fluffy, white, and very well represented because that comes from a very Western 
European, North and American centric idea of what a pet is. Uh, squirrels don't necessarily come with that tag, but they are also uh, pets. I had them as a pet. Uh, there were two in my building when I was growing up. And this kind of, uh, uh, and of course, these are metaphors for a larger problem, right? So uh, what of the other kind of uh, uh, squirrels of this world now? There is, if uh, uh, between animals and between pets, is this, this is the issue. I wonder what the data infrastructure does on skin tone, gender, uh, sexual identity, gender identities, uh, and uh, other forms of uh, uh, marginalization like disability, for example. None of this is uh, actually represented yet from the global south, uh, starting as a conversation where, as uh, uh, Gabriela was mentioning earlier, as uh, uh, people from those communities involved in data protection, production, uh, uh, model production, design, how do we reposition this? And that's, that's what I'm interested in. Uh, now the question then is, what are we regulating on uh, when we talk about AA safety, when we talk about uh, AA ethics? Is, is it that uh, we regulate on uh, a post facto idea of uh, uh, the bunnies are already there and we are trying to keep uh, make sure that the squirrels catch up. But I don't think that will ever uh, happen because the uh, data, the generative way the data is moving, is the pace is quite fast. So maybe I agree with pausing to a certain extent or bringing it down to uh, look at how data infrastructure, uh, infrastructures can be more fair, more justice oriented. And I'm hoping we can apply learnings from this project to, uh, uh, to generative AI across the pipeline of uh, how it is designed, uh, uh, developed, and uh, deployed. Very good, thank you, Shem. So uh, I think today we should uh, add to our lexicon the squirrel fallacy uh, as an issue for uh, for our studies of our critical AI studies. Um, so that so Shem, you you provide us a little bit of a uh, insight into some of the issues uh, about the construction of AI um, uh, having to do with representation. But Angeline, I want to direct a question uh, to you about. Uh, the people who are working around AI. So in particular, um, I believe you have experience working, looking at uh, labor practices and community impacts of data-driven technologies in Kenya and the African context. Can you say a little bit about how Gen AI is participating in ongoing struggles for social justice in these areas? Yes, um, I do hope you can hear me. There seems to be a minor lag uh, between you know, my delivery and you receiving it, but I hope it's not too significant. Um, so in terms of AI, we are still really in the techno optimism phase uh, in Africa, largely, um, and generative AI has sort of just been bundled into that optimism as it is. Um, so we're really looking at it in terms of um, the silver bullet, as had been mentioned earlier, right? It will be the cure all. And the conversations around the pitfalls are still um, really in their uh, nascent stages. Uh, so in terms of um, labor, the future of work, impact, um, what we're really saying is, uh, it's it's still really minimal um, to an extent. So we do have AI utilization, right? But it's not really as significant as it is in um, Europe or the States or other countries. We're still mainly um, consumers of these technologies, right? We're still mainly uh, importers of these technologies. So we are seeing AI being utilized um, in, in e-commerce, for example, we're seeing it being leveraged by small business holders, uh, by gig economy workers. Uh, we're seeing it being utilized um, in places where uh, resources and infrastructure are somewhat lacking. Um, so for example, we have intelligent tutoring system or tech platforms being utilized to um, provide access to children who may not have access to quality education or in areas where the student teacher ratio, you know, just doesn't 
allow for customized education. We have a program that is um, trying to integrate generative AI into oncology treatment in the country. So it's the first of its kind. Um, we have programs um, that are looking at using uh, generative AI algorithms to predict weather patterns, to improve agricultural yields. So we are seeing these tools being utilized on the continent and in Kenya in particular as a whole. Um, so Kenya is sort of known as the Silicon Valley of the savanna. Um, I don't know if that Monica was given to us or we applied it to ourselves, but um, we are known as that. And so we have a lot of AI activity in the country. Um, so again, the potential positive impact are really what is at the forefront of this discussion. Well, the pitfalls um, are on the back end, but we have seen, um, my last point is we have seen, unfortunately, some exploitative practices um, occurring. Um, I don't know if the case with OpenAI and the Kenyan moderators, if that made it across um, to the UK and or to other countries, but practices like that, unfortunately, are occurring more and more often. Um, and there's also the conversation around, well, we're really just consumers of this tech. Um, we haven't had such a say in their you know, development and then the adoption. What does that really mean in terms of um, policies and guardrails that need to be put into place. So uh, in terms of impact and labor, that's kind of the landscape we're looking at right now. Yeah, Angeline, thank you for that. So it's really interesting to pair these uh, questions about the risks of exploitation from AI with also the questions of, of people just having access to the benefits of the technology. Um, it seems that you know if, if people are going to be experiencing uh, burdens from AI, they should at least also be experiencing some of its benefits. Um, and this brings me to my next question, uh, which I direct to Andres. Um, Andres, you have experience studying and think about, about like um, the framings of, of innovation and also um, technology's role in international uh, development, economic development in particular, in the global south. Can you say a little bit about how Gen AI uh, enters into your thinking about the prevailing narratives on these topics? Yeah, thank you. Um, so I think my answer will be a little bit uh, cynical about Gen AI. Um, so I'd like to maybe start to say a bit about my thinking about what data justice is and what global data justice is and what it could be. So we've been, uh, I think there's two aspects to it. I think one, one of it is uh, what we've been discussing so far, which is dealing with harms, with the harms of uh, AI, with the, with the risk, with the uneven costs, etc., and raising these problems. Uh, but there's another aspect to it, which I think is uh, less uh, talked about, which has to do with the question of shifting power and with the question of innovation and what it means to innovate in the global south. And this has uh, links with uh, long going uh, discussions about technological sovereignty, innovation uh, in the south, technological uh, independence, uh, etc. And I think there, there are great examples out there uh, that really use data as a way to empower uh, people, as a way to advance social justice uh, issues. And I think that's also a key component of um, data justice and what it could be. So, uh, for instance, um, there are examples that they might not sound uh, very glamorous and they maybe are not even uh, with AI, but they have a huge impact, for instance, bringing an offline version of Wikipedia to a rural community uh, that doesn't have access to, uh, to internet or uh, translating uh, knowledge uh, into Quechua indigenous languages, uh, etc. Or um, there's the maps, uh, feminist collectives mapping uh, gender violence and, and, and making these issues uh, visible and, uh, and advancing uh, a social justice issue in, 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 in those ways. Uh, and I think generative AI, it's, it's coming into, into this uh, conversation about what innovation means in a very uh, strange way because uh, I've, I've seen um, 
uh, an application of generative AI which has to do with um, pretty much automate, automating innovation in a way. Uh, so there's uh, a lot of discussion about what we can do with generative AI in terms of uh, designing a new, a new product. Um, use Gen AI to design uh, your new product to automate your marketing strategy to create your um, your new website, uh, even to you to do user studies. Uh, so I think it uh, ironically it constrains people's uh, ability to imagine something new and to imagine uh, new futures, which I think it's a key aspect of um, of data justice, uh, and it's also entering uh, the education system as well. I think it's another uh, aspect that we need to be. Uh, very critical uh, about, and I think it should be, uh, as we have learned from the uh, data justice uh, work, that we should center uh, the needs and, uh, and the social justice issues uh, as opposed to AI uh, first. Thank you for that. It's very interesting. There's, a, there's something you mentioned that gave me a thread of an idea that one of the challenges of generative AI is what is it generating? And to, to refer back to Gabriella's comments about imagining a world, imagining a better world, or the world that we, that we would desire to be in. Can generative AI imagine that world? What world does generative AI imagine? Um, Ashna, uh, to you a question. Um, there are numerous efforts to craft policy, and, uh, and uh, this, the AI Summit uh, in Bletchley Park is arguably pointing in that direction. Um, to, and these uh, policy ideas are about promoting opportunities while reigning in its risks and harms. Um, however, I think m we probably are likely to think that most of these are framed primarily from the perspective of uh, the people who have the loudest voices, the biggest platforms, um, Europeans, North Americans, etc. Can you tell us a, a little bit about um, what are some issues raised by Gen AI in particular, but also just AI in general, that you are following most closely right now from, from your perspective? Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Hello. It's a pleasure to be here. I uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity to be able to share an exchange on AI, social justice and equity, uh, especially from uh, an African perspective. So thank you so much, the Queen Mary University, the Alan Turing Institute, uh, and the Parliamentary Group on AI. Um, just a little bit of a background, uh, CIPESA, which is an acronym uh, in full, is the Collaboration on International ICT Policy for East and Southern Africa. We're based out of Kampala, Uganda, but work across the African continent uh, on technology policy, but also its practice and implementation as they intersect with livelihoods, uh, with governance, and with human rights. Uh, of course, in that very big basket, um, AI, data governance, and inclusion, uh, key aspects. And we had the pleasure of working with the Turing Institute on the Advancing Data Justice Project uh, research, and we covered uh, 11 African countries as part of that. So in terms of the issues, um, so f there's no doubt that technology is uh, transforming the African continent is transforming commerce, it's transform, transforming governance, as well as uh, livelihoods. Big data and AI in particular hold a lot of promise uh, for inclusive development and social economic transformation uh, in key sectors such as banking, telecos, fintech, agriculture, health, uh, and development cooperation as well. Um, however, a lot of the products and services are optimized for extraction uh, there are mass data collection exercises related to uh, voter registration, to digital ID, e-government services, um, licenses, driver's licenses, and uh, SIM card registration, uh, which raises uh, a number of concerns around data protection and privacy, as well as security, and key human rights aspects such as freedom of expression, access to information, uh, association, and assembly. Ultimately, that undermines the efficacy of these uh, initiatives that are being rolled out across the continent, uh, especially where decision-making, which is often automated, uh, is being done on a large scale. Uh, and most concerning is that given the democratic deficits in a lot of the continent, uh, the state is weaponizing a lot of this technology and employing worrying tactics uh, that undermine innovation, inclusion, as well as the human rights aspects that I mentioned earlier on. Uh, notable trends include surveillance, 
uh, and that surveillance targeted at democratic actors, uh, journalists, women human rights defenders, uh, as well as civil society organizations, uh, personal data breaches, um, disinformation campaigns that have real life harms. Uh, we've witnessed that not only on the continent, but beyond. Uh, and a lot of that is happening in a context where data protection authorities are inefficient or ill-equipped and ill-resourced to undertake their, um, their mandates. Uh, the most affected, unfortunately, are women, uh, ethnic minorities, persons with disabilities, and migrant communities. Um, and the effects that a lot of the marginalized groups face are what has been discussed here a lot, uh, discrimination. Uh, discrimination that, of course, undermines the rights of these groups. Uh, think women and financial inclusion, for instance. Um, erasure and non-acknowledgement of some identities. Uh, that's uh, a critical challenge. Uh, an example is sexual minorities. Um, a lot of the countries on the continent conduct censuses every so often, and, and these data sets are used to uh, inform a lot of decision making. Uh, there are very limited categories on gender, as you can imagine. Uh, I believe Kenya, Angeline can correct me, is one of the few countries on the continent that added an additional gender uh, characteristics in its recent census. Uh, there's quite a lot of misrepresentation and underrepresentation. Uh, for instance, characteristics around disability. We very often limit that to visual or hearing impairment, but there, there are many other um, characteristics around data. Uh, and all of this that I'm describing is happening uh, in contexts where there's limited uh, redress mechanisms that are available to affected groups. And of course, because the data is lacking in all those components and is not disaggregated, it's unfortunately not informing decision making in the way that it should and, and extending biases. Um, lastly, in terms of policies, um, the landscape is, is just as challenging as there are opportunities in equal measure. Uh, the African Union Data Protection Framework that came into force recently holds a lot of promise in terms of promoting fair and just data ecosystems. Uh, the Malabo Convention, also known as the African Union Convention on Data Protection and Privacy, also has some provisions on data justice that hold a bit of promise. Uh, the African Digital Transformation Strategy as well, uh, particularly pays a lot of attention to uh, marginalized groups in the digital society and promoting cultural diversity. At national level, there's various laws that are in place uh, around data protection and privacy, but like I mentioned earlier on, the authorities are ill-equipped and ill-resourced. Uh, and it was interesting to listen to Gabriela this morning because UNESCO has, uh, has a study that was published for 2021 that highlighted that the data protection laws in a lot of the African countries uh, need to be updated to take into account uh, new use cases, AI applications, all towards ensuring that bias is offset uh, and, and discrimination pushed back against. Uh, on the one hand, that's great, update the existing laws where they exist, but I think there's need to have specific laws that actually address algorithmic bias and discrimination. Uh, this is an area, obviously, that most of the countries on the continent have not uh, put much effort in, and they're underdeveloped in that regard. I have a wish list of recommendations, but I'll pause there for now and hopefully have an opportunity to add later. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that, that rich account. Um, I think there's a lot to be, a lot to unpack in there, but I just want to highlight a couple of, uh, of bits. Um, one is that I think it's clear, and I think all of our presenters have sort of illustrated this, that uh, a key question around generative AI and all AI and data infrastructures isn't the technology, and I think actually you know, some of our speakers have said the same thing. Um, it's the people, it's the humans behind the technology. It's the human systems in which the technology uh, it, uh, it interacts. And so when you have policy frameworks, for example, in Africa that are beginning to address um, certain issues of digital infrastructure, um, they also need to address uh, the, the how, how these will actually function in individual countries, how governments will actually enact or potentially uh, enact these policies or uh, abuse the technologies. And I think that that's something that is being is missing uh, in the summit at Bletchley Park. Uh, while we talk about AI safety, we ought to be talking about safety from whom, right? Maybe some of the same people who are sitting around the table in Bletchley are actually some of the biggest uh, threats uh, we have to face. Um, well, in the interest of time, um, I think I'm going to wrap it up, but I just want to get a couple of final comments from 
you all. I'm referring back to uh, the, uh, the shenanigans at Bletchley Park. Sorry, a little bit more respectful. The activities taking place, the responsible adult activities taking place at Bletchley Park, um, which, has been, which is coining or, or naming itself a global summit, right? A global summit on AI. But here we have uh, people uh, on the stage, I think, who represent parts of the globe who may be uh, quite underrepresented at this global summit. And so I'd like to ask each of you to think in terms of a policy prescription that you think should be at the table at a truly global summit uh, for AI. And uh, Angeline, I'd like to, to start with you, hopefully having caught you off guard. Sure. Um, I think even before we begin with policy prescriptions, I don't think we should be having these discussions if we don't have all the entities at the table. Um, we can't start talking about responsible AI or ethical AI or data justice or any of these terms that are really um, buzzwords that we throw around without having everyone as part of that conversation, right? And if that is going to happen, which historically has been what has happened, right? Even in the global south, you're sort of presented with a set of policies or laws or trade agreements and um, your leverage position is not optimal to say the list. Um, so you either buy into it or uh, if you opt out, you suffer the consequences. So I think the fear here is that when we're looking at AI, or even when we're just looking at the technologies around this fourth industrial revolution, which is coming, um, that if we continue with the same practices, then what we will see is the same inequalities, you know, being entrenched or widening the, those who are in positions of power. And I'm speaking at a global level, will retain those positions of power. And those who have historically been marginalized, again, will be marginalized, right? Um, so I think even before we begin talking about policies, then we, we need to make sure when we're making these policies, everyone has a, has a seat at this table. Um, so in terms of specific ones, I think it's really essential that um, we, we think about um, autonomy, um, right? If, if, if we are bringing African countries to the ta negotiating table or countries from the global south who are in weaker bargaining positions, then we really need to make sure the policies put in place um, are mindful and respectful and really make sure that they prioritize these countries' autonomy. So we are in positions to yay or nay as is beneficial to our own people, right? Um, and then lastly, I think that we haven't, this hasn't really been discussed and I don't see it mentioned um, a lot, but I think we also need to have sort of policies that have an opt out button. Um, in the way we talk about AI and data and datafication, it seems that we don't really place much importance on um, entities that just don't want to be part of this, so whether it's, um, you know, communities, maybe for whatever reason, uh, would rather be left in peace, or whether it's um, governments or nations that do not have the ability right now to participate and would like to opt out until they're best able to play in this particular uh, arena. Um, I think policies should also have opt-out buttons that don't necessarily disenfranchise or disadvantage those people who decide, or those nations, excuse me, uh, or communities that decide that, um, you know, we're good for now. <laughs> we can revisit this conversation a bit later. Um, so I think going forward, those are things that uh, I think should be at our forefront, the forefront of our minds when you're talking about policies and global discourse around AI in general. Thank you, Angeline. Um, Sham, what about you? Yes, uh, I'd like to push back on the idea of uh, the frontier itself. Frontier, if you unpack it, the you know uh, frontier is itself is a colonial idea uh, that it is an extractivist pushing of uh, an essentialist idea. Let me call it frontier essentialism. Why should something continuously be generatively be explored without having taken into account what has already happened and questioning ourselves whether that has been ethically done. 
And uh, 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 I think Ashna mentioned something about uh, uh, recourse. Where is the, uh, the co course for, uh, uh, the pathway for recourse in any of this? Uh, the frontier idea, the pushing of uh, boundaries here, of course has to happen in a lot of very specific uh, sectors. Of course, in medical technology, it has to be uh, done but then they come with very well set regulations. Whereas the frontier pushes on that uh, on the other side without having pushed on need for regulation as well. So you, it, that's why we, we see, uh, you know, uh, players like DeepMind asking for regulation while they're pushing, pushing, uh, pushing the technology forward. So uh, I, and there is another idea of uh, democratic deficit uh, that was uh, picked up, right? And I think policy needs to address another deficit, uh, a socio-cultural deficit on where this, uh, uh, the frontier technologies are actually uh, being built. Uh, the deficit is not necessarily only making law uh, where it is being applied, but where it is being built, it, they don't understand what they're building to a certain extent. And there is a kind of a seeding of power to the technology itself saying, oh, this thing is emergent, we don't have any more control on it because it's generative and it's done this. We will now think back and see how we can undo it. I think the policy needs to kind of, uh, regulation needs to attack that particular instance where it cannot seed power. They cannot seed power without having a socio-cultural understanding, a, a, sp a specific participative uh, a way uh, to get people on board ex ante, as uh, 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 Gabriela was also mentioning uh, earlier. Uh, that, that's the main issue because uh, uh, discrimination, unfortunately, at this point uh, is what I would like to say is a generative discrimination. Not only they are not represented on the table, their data is mis being misrepresented and the data generated is flowing back into this whole generative cycle, uh, beget begetting more and more discriminative uh, impact. None of that is being uh, uh, addressed in current uh, regulatory cycle because we are saying we, it cannot be done and ergo it's existential. It really is not existential because some of these are already happening elsewhere in the world. It's just not, not being listened to. So we resist the language of frontiers, all right? Yeah, Andres, what about you? Yeah, just to, to agree with what's been said and about the question of, of governance, I think, um, I think it's important to recenter uh, the issues of, of justice. So it's, it's always talked about as if uh, data justice has to be inherently about the margins and it has to be, or by definition, about the margins of, or the fringes, but it doesn't have to be. And it, there's, uh, there's an opportunity to bring these issues into the center of the conversation. And there are examples of that, like Ashna mentioned, there's uh, already governments doing that, uh, bringing uh, data justice issues into uh, the conversation. So I think uh, that's uh, when a uh, key uh, thing that needs to be done, bringing this to spaces of uh, parliament and uh, assemblies. Another thing is that um, not everything has to do, has, has to be about the latest development. Because everything uh, seems to be gravitating about um, the, the latest tech and um, what about thinking about other, other metrics? What about uh, um, human, human flourishing? Um, and then thinking about uh, innovation as opposed to putting innovation first for the sake uh, of innovation. And then uh, one final point that, that I think we, that we can learn from uh, discussions about data justice and, and about global data justice is that uh, and adding to the things that, that we could reject, uh, reject this uh, universalism that everything uh, needs to be scaled up and everything needs to uh, be deployed uh, everywhere in, in, the, in the same fashion. And, and the other thing to reject is the narratives of this is inevitable. So this is uh, coming and this is uh, the future and this is going to happen and we have to brace for it. Um, there, there might be other ways uh, uh, to do anything. So I think those are two key, le key lessons that we can learn from data justice. Right, so we needn't be led by the rhetoric of, of innovation, right? We can be led by uh, perhaps our better angels. Ashna, what about you? What are some final thoughts on, on policy uh, directions we could be taking? I did say I had a whole wish list, so I've got to like slim that down. And I won't limit myself only to policy. 
but uh, practice as well. First is uh, democratizing the data value chain, uh, ensuring that there's equality at all stages, collection, analysis, dissemination, and sharing. That would go a long way uh, in, in combating some of the biases and discriminations that we're talking about today. Um, also linked to democratization is uh, ensuring there's representation uh, in the collectors of the data, representation in the designers of the algorithms, representation in fact checkers, individuals that are immersed in the context that we're describing, individuals that understand uh, the nuances that, that we're talking about. That's a first. Um, second, uh, for much of the continent, and I believe probably the same in the Western world, is that uh, private sector is in the driving seat of AI and data justice. Uh, there's need for efforts that are targeted at policymakers, at regulators, at activists and civil societies like ourselves to be able to question power, to be able to uh, push back uh, and ask, seek for transparency and accountability of both state and non-state actors, uh, and also have uh, dedicated efforts that increase awareness, capacity, and knowledge uh, amongst users, which is extremely limited from uh, an African perspective, of course. Lastly, which um, we've found that it, it has potential in, in the policy landscape is strategic litigation. Uh, CIPESA has been part of two cases that have challenged digital ID and the exclusion aspects of it. The first one was in Kenya, the Huduma number, which is a, a digital ID uh, scheme. And similarly, in Uganda, there's an ongoing case that's also pushing back against the digital ID system um, and the exclusion and bias aspects that it represents for communities. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ajna. Thank you, um, all of the panelists. Please join me in thanking our excellent panel and, uh, and thank you for your attention. Well, what a thought-provoking session, pushing us to think about the wider global context where these technologies are used and sometimes abused. In this se session, we will shift the focus from global data justice to academia itself for a fireside chat that explores the transformative effects of the rising generative AI era on teaching, learning, and scholarship. We have three wonderful speakers with us today. We have Dr. Jean Ines, who joined the Alan Turing Institute as CEO in July 2023. She has worked across the public, private, and nonprofit sectors to use data science and AI to solve real world challenges and acted as technology advisor to the World Economic Forum's Infrastructure Council. At the AI firm faculty, she managed a series of data science and machine learning strategic and operational projects. Prior to that, Dr. Innes was Director of Consumer Data at Rightmove, the UK's largest online property search website, and gained early insight into the deployment of AI at scale while managing commercial relationships within Amazon's retail business. We also have with us today Professor Xiao Li Meng, the Whipple V. N. Jones Professor of Statistics, and the founding editor in chief of Harvard Data Science Review. He's well known for his depth and breadth in research, his innovation and passion in pedagogy, and his vision and effectiveness in administration. Professor Meng is the recipient of numerous awards and honors for his more than 150 publications in at least a dozen theoretical and methodological areas, as well as in areas of pedagogy and professional development. He received his Bachelor of Science in Mathematics from Fudan University in 1982, and his PhD in statistics from Harvard in 1990. He was on the faculty of University of Chicago from 1991 to 2001, before returning to Harvard, where he served as the chair of the Department of Statistics and the Dean of Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. Last, but certainly not least, we have with us Professor David Leslie, whom you've already met, but I would like to say a few words. He is the Director of Ethics and Responsible Innovation Research at the Alan Turing Institute and Professor of Ethics, Technology and Society here at Queen Mary University of London. Before moving to the UK, he taught at Princeton University's Center for Human Values and held academic appointments at Yale's program in Ethics, Politics and Economics 
who led Harvard's Committee on Degree in Social Studies, where he received over a dozen teaching awards, including the 2014 Stanley Hoffman Prize for Teaching Excellence. Professor Leslie served as selected member of the Bureau of the Council of Europe's Ad Hoc Committee on Artificial Intelligence and was appointed Specialist Advisor to the Council of Europe's Committee on AI. As part of his international work, Professor Leslie also serves on UNESCO's high-level expert group, steering the implementation of its recommendation on um, the ethics of artificial intelligence, which, as we have heard earlier today, is a first-of-its-kind document adopted by the 193 member states of the organization. Please join me in welcoming our three speakers on stage. Hello, is that working? Excellent. Um, so I'm Jean Innes, um, as Cosmina, Cosmina kindly said, the new um, Chief, Chief Executive Officer at the Alan Turing Institute. And I'm delighted to be here in this beautiful room that I've never been in before. Um, it's magnificent. So thank you for the invitation. I'm delighted to be here. Now, I think Cosmina was a bit generous in her billing. I'm the facilitator, by no means um, a, a participant in what I'm sure is going to be a fabulous conversation. Um, so without further ado, and I sort of, may I move my chair so it feels a little more, um, <laughs> Professor Zhao Li, can you hear us okay? Hi Zhao Li. Yes, I can hear you very well. And, uh, thank you for having me and my apologies can't be there in person, but I hope the Zoom version at least give me to share some screen. Perfect. It's a great honor to have you with us. Um, so um, I think our topic is um, the transformative effects of the rising generative AI era on teaching, learning and scholarship, with a particular emphasis on the role that responsible data science and public communication can play in managing risks to academic and research integrity. I'll allow myself the chair's prerogative of a quick aside, um, just to um, share with you, I do actually have a PhD. Um, it, I'm a scientist by training, um, so my PhD was in organic chemistry, feels quite a long time ago, but it means that I'm very, very interested in research integrity um, and the topic we're discussing today. So without further ado, I will um, uh, begin by, um, uh, a question for Professor Zhao Li. Um, for the past few years, um, I understand you've dedicated um, considerable professional effort to building the Harvard Data Science Review, uh, and which has won many accolades, the 2021 Prose Award for Best New Journal in Science, Technology and Medicine. Congratulations. Could you tell us briefly a bit about your journey in developing the HDSR as a journal that reaches out to a broader audience beyond AI and data science communities of practice? I'd be very happy to. Um, let me, if you uh, allow me, let me just share the screen because it happens that the latest issue we just published, which was last Friday, has lots of articles on AI. And I'd like just to uh, share what these articles are as a way to introduce uh, Harvard Data Science Review. And Harvard Data Science Review was created uh, about uh, five years ago, and uh, our slogan is everything data science and data science for everyone. And uh, uh, we trying to build an international platform, global forum for uh, having, you know, the entire data science community to uh, getting together to, you know, talk about all these issues we all care, but usually we don't have a chance to have a single forum to have these exchanges. Can you see the screen here? But uh, let me launch it too. So um, the, we publish all kinds of articles, anything pertaining to data science. And uh, uh, we currently has an open call for this uh, special issue, Future Shock, right, uh, grabbing with the generative AI revolution. And actually Dave is one of the uh, co-editor for this special issue and wrote pretty much the entire call for um, the, the, the submission. And we have four categories. The first is, um, well, first I put, always write an editorial introducing each uh, issues because it covers a broad range of articles. 
And uh, um, if you're curious, what is a homo sapien intelligence, you can certainly uh, look, look it up and uh, uh, it's entirely free. You can check any time, of course, not right now. And the, uh, we, the first section is panorama and it features overviews, visions, and debates. And in this issue, we have four articles. Three of them are exclusively on conversations on AI and how AI is being used, for example, with UN's refugee effort and uh, how the AI is being used, particularly chat GPT in the financial market. And we also have this conversation with Steve Pinker really on what is intelligence, what's the relationship with language. So I highly uh, you know, encourage to read these articles. Uh, we have another article about this uh, credibility crisis, talking about responsible use of AI. And this is the, in the, uh, in the uh, health sector. And unfortunately, lots of these predictive algorithms are actually don't really fit for the uh, clinical utility. And so uh, this is worth reading in terms of the kind of uh, uh, problems we, we may face. The second category is conocopia, which is about impact innovation and the knowledge transfer. And in this particular case, we have an article about, um, about how the US Census Bureau has doing this, uh, you know, defense of privacy. If privacy is another big issue, but how do we make these data are uh, both private and useful? That's another, you know, big topic face or uh, you know face all of us doing research as well as being uh, being a user the set of sort of category teaching and communication and in this case uh, in this issue we have an article uh, surveyed using machine learning algorithm over a thousand articles that have touched on various aspects of data science education so it's it's a uh, incredibly interesting rich article for those who are interested in data science education particularly in communication because that is really a big part of it um the last section is the, what we call the milestones and milestone that's about a foundation series and methods that's where all the series you know uh, methodology uh, series comes in this is where you will see some greek letters and for this particular one is how we're using the ais as an alternative tool to collect particular chat gpt to collect opinions uh, as you know that's uh, political opinion these days are particularly important and a survey tends to have all kinds of selection bias but can the chat gpt do better and you should read the article to see what the conclusion is now let me just move very quickly we also have six or uh, seven columns and in this issue that we feature four of them uh, effective policy learning is about uh reaching out to all the government uh, in this case we're talking about evidence-based policy make policy making act of the united states how do you know where are these data Mining the future is about uh, elementary pre-college uh, education in some data science. And this one is about students reaction and teachers reaction to this whole chat GPT. And uh, we have just had a new column about reinforcing reproducibility and the replicability. That's actually incredibly important for, uh, for us to uh, gain the public trust in terms of what we do. And so this one talking about why sociology is pretty slow in this particular issue of scientific transparency, which is obviously incredibly important for, for, uh, for, you know, for the science itself. And uh, so, yeah, actually uh, three, three sections. And uh, so um, that's just a quick introduction to uh, Harvard Data Science Review. And I will certainly welcome a uh, lot more people to read, but also get the words out and uh, contributing articles. And I'd be happy to answer any questions about this uh, later. Wonderful. Thank you, Zhao Li. Um, we do have, I think, some time for Q&A at the end. Um, personally, I spotted several articles that I am going to go and look up. It looks fascinating. Thank you. Thank um, you. May I home in on our topic for today, um, which is inviting Zhao Li to comment um, through your roles as a professor and former chair of Harvard's Department of Statistics and as the dean of Harvard's Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. So a really broad, broad sort of perspective. Could you share with us your thoughts about the range of risks and potential benefits across higher education and indeed across the broader academic community of obviously sure, uh, generative AI? Uh, yes, uh, I assume you're giving me three hours to work. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> you know, this is a topic I think each one of us will have many, many things to say. But I uh, thought about, and I think I'm probably focusing on three points, uh, three points I probably have not heard enough emphasis, and I'm sure uh, David has many, many, many points that uh, uh, you know, he can cover 
So the three points from me, uh, both in terms of faculty, uh, you know, ex-dean and the chair thinking about what, what is most valuable to faculty and what's most important to students and also what's most important for a general community. In terms of faculty, I guess that uh, uh, for all of us, not necessarily just faculty, the probably the most uh, important thing that we usually don't think we have enough is the time. We, you know, we're all so busy, we have so many things to do. So to me, what has happened this arrival of the ChatGPT and other uh, similar technology is that I, I realized that I'm really reallocating my time. Uh, not necessarily saving me time, but it's reallocating my time. I'll give you a very simple simple example that initially the, my first trial on the uh, ChatGPT, I just give ChatGPT one line. I say, you know, give me a fundraising plan for Harvard Data Science Review. It immediately gave me eight points, right? And I look at them, you know, nothing is earth shattering because I, you know, I knew this fundraising pretty well, but they are all very well organized. They they can be implemented. And that only takes us like, you know, literally just, you know, a few seconds, right? That saved me a lot of time just to even put them down. But then I realized I spent a lot more time on something which is, I'm sure each of us has been doing a lot, whether you know the term or not, that's called a prompt engineer, right? We, we keep kind of chatting with the chat GPT, trying to make the work for us, okay? And uh, so I'm not necessarily saving time, but I'm reallocating my time. Uh, but I think that's very important. I think uh, this whole prompt engineer itself, uh, which is really related to the second point I want to make, it really makes, you know, showcase how important it is in terms of our communication skills, right? Talking to AI is truly a communication ability. It's a, it's a communication skill. And I think that this is a great thing for training our students. And now I used to tell my students that I teach a course on uh, the arts and the practice of teaching and communicating statistics. So I tell them the importance of uh, communication, teaching, why that is you know, good for their career. But now I don't really have to emphasize to them. They know how important it is. You know, when you're not communicating well with ChatGPT, it, it just won't give you what you want. And I think that that actually has a great impact. Uh, we need to emphasize more. We need to um, you know, help students to think about all these communication skills. Now, communicating with AI is particularly different because we do not, we still don't quite understand how, you know, does it, it even think, right? We don't think AI is really thinking and it probably does not have its own motivation. So it, it brings an entirely different dimension to how to communicate. But I think that in that space, uh, we can really provide more training to our students. I also think this kind of a communication is an enhancement of intel intelligence for humans is itself because you know the general understanding of the intelligence is is our ability to get things we want and this is literally about get what you want by how do you uh, finding the right of way how do you prompt how do you you know get the machine to understand you quote unquote uh, to do to achieve your goal i think that there's a lot of uh, trainings we can do in that space the last point i want to mention uh, this really considering the, you know, the days when I went through as the Dean of the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences. And I'm trained as a statistician, but as a Dean, I have to uh, talk to humanists, uh, talk to social scientists, and I find myself completely inadequate. I, you know, always sweating when I go to these departments because I don't even know what constitutes as romance language, for example. And so, but the one thing that I think of what is incredibly important, and I hope we will emphasize more, even just the term large language model, literally bring the language into the picture, right? If we think about now, we all think about how important it is to understand language. How much intelligence is actually in the text? And this is the biggest thing for all the data scientists, those of us who are always thinking about in terms of numbers, because the text is a much, much better way of communicating these, you know, document these intelligence, much more nuanced, and typically in old days, when we do the data science, we translate or we transform these texts into some numbers, and then we analyze them. And that is such a waste as we understand now. But trying to analyze the uh, text directly, which apparently large language model has this ability to at least get, get those uh, complicated patterns that we do not usually get. 
I think that, that is the real advance. It's not an advance of data science, it's an advance of data engineering. And I think that another aspect we should really emphasize, and we should teach our students a lot more about how do you, whatever you study, you need to understand the language. That literally is bringing humanity into the whole picture. And I think that that's something we could do a lot more than we have been doing. What extraordinarily interesting observations. And may I say, I recognize your third point very personally as um, someone with a reasonably technical background and who has uh, is it an organization that has a real range of those skills and i must say i'm a big fan of working out that common language or that common understanding because that's when you have the really good conversations which i think is sort of what today is about in a way um, if i may come to um, professor leslie or may i say david now that you are a colleague um, david same question to you um, our topic today um, over the past few months i've learned that you've published a couple of pieces in nature review physics interesting, and AI ethics. Um, would you, and those articles explore the potential impacts of the expanding use of generative AI on research integrity and scientific discovery. As a trained scientist, can you give us a landscape review of that work and you know, how is research integrity uh, bearing up? Well, I mean, as, as I'm sometimes liable to do when, 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 we, uh, when you think about scientific discovery, I, I want to be philosophical first and then more, more concrete. Um, and it actually refer back to something that um, Mike, Mike Cattell was talking about um, when, when he mentioned imagination, right? And the, and, the, and the importance of imagination in making the worlds that we live in, right? So uh, in, in one, of the, one of these articles, uh, Basically, the, the article's title was, Does the Sun Rise for ChatGPT? And, uh, and Jali will be familiar with this because uh, I sent him the, the, article, the, uh, some, the abstract. So uh, the, basically what the article does, it starts with a, a quote from uh, Norwood Russell Hansen, the great philosopher of science uh, from the mid 20th century. He was a, a predecessor of Thomas Kuhn's uh, and really inspired the movement of thinking about scientific paradigms. And uh, Hansen asked the question, Does this, did the sun rise for Johannes Kepler? And it's, it, it was uh, a question that w was taken in many different ways. Um, but the reason he asked that question is he wanted to sort of uh, make a distinction between the world in which, say, an Aristotle or a Ptolemy moved around in, which was an Earth-centered world, right, in which the sun rose for them, quite literally, Right? The sun would rise as if pulled by a chariot across the sky, right? But then, for, and then he asked the question, did it rise for Kepler? Because Kepler navigated an entirely different world, right? Kepler's world was a world in which the horizon dropped, right? And the earth moves. And so uh, his point was that these two worlds are fundamentally different worlds. But not only that, that they're theory dependent, theory laden, and interpretation dependent. And the distance from a Ptolemy to a Kepler or a Copernicus is a distance of uh, being able to uh, engage in scientific world making, right? To, to recreate a new world from new observations through scientific discovery, right? And Einstein talks about how uh, uh, the, the capacity for wonder and the mysterious, is, is how he puts it, stands at the cradle of true art and true science. And I, I bring that up because the, 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 the world-making part of science, the creative part of science, the imagination part of science is something that we need to sort of acknowledge and protect. When we think about what generative AI is doing, this is a categorically distinctive um, activity, right? You've got a, a, a statistical system which is drawing inferences from uh, the distribu prior distributions of data and projecting that into uh, predictions about word sequences in the case of large language models, right? There is no semantics in that, in, in that process. There is no interpretation. There is no, if you will, engagement of a world of experience in which sci scientists move around in discover and, and sense make. And so, I mean, in that work, basically what I'm pointing out is we, we need to be very aware that uh, data-driven systems can help us do, do various things. 
However, we can't live in a world in which science becomes data-driven. Um, in the sense that data, meaning datum, uh, the, which means that which is given, um, can it contain in it uh, all sorts of, of uh, prejudices, patterns of exclusion, uh, and other. And so when you have a, a large language model, right, that, that's trained on massive corpora of data from the past, that data will reflect who has had access to knowledge and resources, who has uh, been uh, in parts of the world that, that have uh, had particular histories uh, with regard to science, it, to the exclusion of other parts of the world. Um, and that data will also uh, heavily reflect those who have been dominant in scientific paradigms. And so what you have, if you have a date, sort of fully data-driven science that doesn't take heed of the importance of scientific creativity, you can have paradigm lock-in, and you can have a, a, se a sense in which uh, the, the kind of uh, increased productivity of having a system do a literature review or text mining or these other productivity tools for academic researchers, that it can, it can ossify the process. And, and we really need to be careful that we, that we don't end up in a world where we can't have the next Einstein or you know, the next uh, Curie or you know, the next innovator. Gosh, fascinating. Um, I will just throw in, um, as a chemist, um, something that really caught my uh, imagination was, um, uh, any scientist in the room? Uh, oh, uh, one or two. Um, so a benzene ring is a, a six carbons in a loop. And the story is that the guy who first worked out the structure of benzene, um, there was just this, it was impossible to understand how it had the properties that it had. But with, without understanding the structure, and the structure wasn't understood. And apparently, he had a dream where he dreamed about six snakes, um, each, the, each snake biting the tail of the last. And apparently, um, that's, and that's for me, an encapsulation of human creativity. Who knows what his neural networks were doing at that point, but um, if it is true, and it's an example of creativity, I believe creativity in science. So thank you so much for those wise observations. Um, I'm sort of, I think I'm inclined to maybe home in on really the role of um, HDSR and actually um, the organization which David is a part of in terms of um, the, the important role of public communication of these sorts of concepts. And maybe if we give reasonably concise responses, and then I'd love to have some time if there are questions, I think it'd be really nice with, with these eminent scholars with such interesting material, I think it'd be really nice to have some time for Q&A. Does that sound like a plan? Excellent. Yes. So maybe first of all to Zhao Li, um, just locking back on the um, HDSR, uh, a, a really important new uh, uh, presence in the debate. Um, would you like to comment on the role, the constructive role that public communication initiatives like HDSR can play in conveying the character and limitations of generative AI as a science. Again, one personal reflection is there are relatively few people that really understand the sort of technical underpinnings, but also care about explaining it. So would you like to give us your reasonably concise comments on that, please? Sure, I think the most important thing for these publications, particularly uh, like what we create for uh, really the broad data science community or the public is trying to establish ourselves to be a place where the information we provide, you can trust. Gaining the public trust, I think that's far important than actually, you know, uh, the particular technology or uh, technique you're using these days. As we all know, there are way too much disinformation, misinformation, whatever you want to call them. The worst part is now that these label themselves is being used to discredit anything you don't like. So now even, you know, it's not like, okay, if somebody said disinformation, then it's, well, that's disinformation. It's everybody used, well, not, not everybody, hopefully, but there are plenty of actors using these labels. And I think so most important to me, and I wrote editorial for my last issue, and I call it AI data science. AI here does not for, uh, is not stand for, does not stand for artificial intelligence, but rather stand for agonistic and independent. And I think that is a very hard one to do. I also understand there are generally, uh, for example, we have, uh, you know, certainly uh, for the right reason, we emphasize uh, data science should be value-driven. 
And I think that's important. The only problem when you emphasize too much of that is who's value. And that's where the problem comes in. And so, and also trying to be independent uh, to be kind of a you know fair sometimes it, it's uh, it's not necessarily easy because you know sometimes you just have these what people call inconvenient truths right it does not necessarily match your ideology match your value but if you really care about having a place where people can trust you just sometimes have to publish these inconvenient truths because otherwise you're just doing cherry picking no matter what it doesn't matter what you publish is true or not. Because these days, the one problem is people question each other's motivation, right? Why do you publish this piece we don't publish other piece? And I think that's an incredible hard one. I know it's, you know, I have to make decisions sometimes. I'm trying to be as open as possible. And you probably can tell from what we publish in HDSR. But from my own experience, I think that's the hardest one. And to me, for me, just let me finish very quickly. I tend to talk too much, is that as an educator, I think the most important thing is we need to teach our students there's still such thing called a fact. There's still such thing that we should all agree, regardless what your ideology is, whatever your value is. Fact is fact, science, there are scientific facts. There's things that are debatable, you can be speculative, but there are still things that we need to agree with each other. And I think that's probably the most important thing uh, these platforms should emphasize. Thank you so much. Um, David, how can the Alan Turing Institute, which we both uh, work at, help with this too? Well, I think to build on what uh, Zhao Li was saying, there are such things as facts. There's also just such things as the scientific method, scientific rigor, evidence-based uh, uh, examinations of questions that have uh, consequence in the world. And I think uh, from, the, from the perspective of the Alan Turing Institute, the, being a, a kind of holder of gold standards in rigor, for instance, in uh, explainability, in replicability, in reproducibility, um, carrying forward that paradigm of uh, projecting out to the world of science that we need to prioritize first and foremost the integrity of research. I think m more than anything, the work that we do at the, at the Turing is focused on this, right? Just think about the Turing way, right? Which is really oriented to open science because it is only through that kind of process of opening science to the eyes of, of others, to the, to the eyes of, of peer review and, and sort of critical thinkers who understand the science and can, can, can make it better that we advance science. And that, that, I think that sort of uh, set of mechanisms to, to ensure rigor and integrity is, is what's most important for a national research institute of, of data science and artificial intelligence. Uh, the other bit that I would say is important is the public communication of science. Um, some of the speakers earlier were talking about how, for instance, we, we just assume that young people uh, know about AI because they're natives to AI. And we can never assume in any instance that uh, the, the science in, in, in writ large is being properly uh, received and communicated because in the media, there are so many ways in which things get inflated. There are, there's tech boosterism and there's you know, many different ways in which there isn't good public communication of science. And so from, I think from the Institute's standpoint, we, we absolutely prioritize um, the ability to convey uh, scientific concepts, concepts of data science in accessible and understandable ways for the public and prioritizing cognitive equity, which is to say prioritizing always the lowest common denominator so that no one feels excluded from um, the sorts of technical language that we actually have to do, deal with every day. Thank you so much. Um, I, I'm going to suggest we thank our two uh, speakers and then we maybe have a little time for Q&A. We have five minutes. See how many questions we can fit in if there are questions. Oh, there's a very enthusiastic hand at the back there. Can you hear me? Yes. Um, can. First and foremost, thank you very much. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, Michael Borelli, AI and Partners. Regulation is a big, uh, uh, interest of mine, put a lot of 
um, personal and professional sort of energy into it. My question for you guys is, what areas of academic research are, mo in, are most in need of um, exploration in terms of regulation? And forgetting all the sort of hyperbole and all the sort of high level stuff, the granular, what really forensic issues need to be examined? Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, could, could we, I didn't quite, could you just give us, uh, just give us the question again? Um, Sorry, what areas of regulation does it um, deserve um, which, area, which areas of scientific research yes, deserve yeah, regulation? Got yeah. it. And would you just tell us again your affiliation? I should have said that. Michael Borelli, AI and Partners. Great. Uh, I'm looking at, uh, would, would Professor Shaoli, would you like to come in? I would uh, defer that to David. David probably ah. thought this a lot more than I have. Yeah. I mean, I would say, I think that we, we, we need to understand that mm -hmm basically all domains are being impacted, right, by this transformative moment of generative AI. And so it is, it is the case that we, we need uh, kind of rigorous evidence-based approaches to regulation across all sectors. But I would point out that the, the ones for me that are, are most important are the, those that are, are most high impacting, right? So, and most safety critical. So thinking, if, if for instance, in areas of uh, biomedical research and clinical you know, medicine, uh, areas uh, like transportation, right, with autonomous vehicles and various ways that complex systems are being used in, in that world. Um, thinking back to the, the, the medical instance, uh, you know, there's a rush to potentially use uh, AI-enabled chatbots, right, generative AI-enabled chatbots to give, you know, medical advice. And we, we really need to have a, a deep and a better understanding of the potential for these systems to perform unpredictably and, and to potentially recommend something that can harm somebody, uh, you know, depending on the context. So I think the safety critical and high impact areas are those that we really need to focus on first. Great, thanks David. I've got a good one coming in from online. This is a good pedagogical one. Um, how and when are schools going to adapt existing tech? So teachers uh, teaching and examinations are not focused on spotting the use of tech, but shift the philosophy on examination. Professor? That, yes, I'm happy to uh, give you my thought. The, uh, that's, that's a really great question. Mm -hmm. And uh, all universities these days are, you know, thinking hard about what we do. Um, just give you a, a simple example. In the, the when the ChatGPT coming, the first thing uh, we all worry about as teachers is about, you know, how do we give homework, right? Because you know, the homework can be answered, and the, some of my colleagues will completely just, you know, ditch the homework. And, but there are others being more creative, and this is a part of, uh, you know, thinking. Uh, for example, instead of say here the homework problem, you can say okay here is the here the problem here the answer provided by ChatGPT. Now is it right, right? And you know that just provides another way of uh, you know thinking about how to answer this question. But I think probably the big picture here is you know the way we have doing this assessment in in the education space has been pretty much has not been changed for the last you know hundred years. So I think this is a time for us to really rethink about how to do those things. There are, there are many creative ideas. There are, uh, there are the technology itself can you know can be used. And uh, and I think about to me the most important part whenever we do those things. And I this part of the thing I did when I was a dean is I would engage the students uh, directly because in the end it's the they're the one being affected. If we sometimes had these problems. The professor get together think about. What's the best way, you know, doing the assessment without engaging the students? And usually, that's that's like, you know, you have you 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 think you have a great product, you never engage the consumers. How would you know, right? And so I think that that is the part that uh, uh, I would simply encourage we do more. Thank you, David. Would you like to comment on this one? I mean, as a, I think back to to my college days, and I had a teacher who um, it was a it was an intellectual history class. And everybody dreaded exam time because what he did was he brought us into the room with, with these little blue books, we call them, with just, uh, we only would, would be able to bring a pen. And he would just give one quote and we would, from, a, from one of the books that, in the intellectual history, and we'd have to identify it and then recreate the author's argument. 
um, writing without any access to computers or anything. And I'll tell you, I learned more from that class just having to sort of master the text than I've ever learned in any, any other class. And so I'm mentioning that because I think pedagogy is, uh, again, a creative endeavor. And it's an endeavor that needs to be responsive to, to, the, to the developing humans that are part of it. And uh, it may well be that personalized learning is a, an affordance that's um, enabled by technology. There are many supportive technologies that, that will advance education and advance equity in education. Uh, for instance, assisting uh, non-native uh, speakers to sort of produce papers or write in, in, in a different language. Um, so I do think that there's, there's opportunities, but at the same time, we need to sort of prioritize that moment of developing people to become, to be, to become the mature and, and sort of uh, well-prepared uh, citizens and members of the public that they need to be. And that, that won't happen if we kind of over-rely on technology. I think we're probably on time, but what a lovely comment to end on. And can I once more ask uh, uh, us to show our appreciation of two fabulous uh, speakers today? Thank you. Thank you, Professor Zhao Thank you very much for having me. So it's lunchtime. And I'm, we're so sorry that it's, it's gone a little bit long, so I bet, bet everybody's hungry, so. The capabilities of new technologies have advanced rapidly in recent years, transforming our everyday lives for better and worse. Advancing Data Justice, a film series by the Allen Turing Institute, explores the human consequences of this transformation by looking to stories at the intersection of social justice and data protection. It does so thanks to the contribution of 12 global partners who have been working around the world to fight for just, fair, and equitable uses of data. In this series, they share their insights into the past, present, and future of data justice. In episode one, we explored the different ways in which data justice has been understood around the world. Principles of social justice, all instances of data collection and use. Data justice for me is about using data in a way that's fair. Data justice means in China, it's more, but probably much more people write as data for good or data for common good. In this episode, we dive into the human consequences of data injustice. To do this, we will explore just a few of the many examples of injustice which our global partners have researched, exposed, and resisted. What is considered as another piece in one community may not be seen as false in another community. Data injustice is uh, any sort of inequities or power imbalances that exist in our society. Um, uh, that are either reflected in the data that we collect and how we use it, or uh, result in similar injustices. I would say that uh, data justice is more positive way of defining things, but data injustice is more the way things are happening these days in life. Despite concerns that data injustice has become the norm, awareness of its human impact is not widespread. The main concern, I believe, is that um, the issues of data and data justice are not really in uh, the public sphere. They're not part of the public discourse. Um, so the public is not as knowledgeable on these issues as they should be. They're not really uh, at the forefront of their minds. To resolve this challenge and increase awareness of data injustices, it's necessary 
to move beyond abstract definitions and show human examples of how data injustice is present in our everyday. Challenges to data justice come in many forms. There is no simple way to categorize these diverse harms, nor is it possible to cover the full range of challenges to data justice in this episode. Nonetheless, the stories told here do illustrate key patterns in how data injustice can manifest. First, we share examples where datafication has resulted in the loss of resources, whether this is financial, material, or otherwise. Second, we share examples where datafication has caused harm on the basis of identity. As each story will illustrate, Harms of allocation and harms of representation are deeply entangled with one another. One way in which the harms caused by datafication have been understood by our partners is through examples where fair access to resources has been undermined by data-driven technologies. Fair access to resources has long been central to social justice. Unfortunately, this principle has at times been deeply threatened by digital technologies. One arena in which such harms have occurred is the gig economy. In 2022, Digital Empowerment Foundation sat down with several drivers in Hyderabad, India to discuss their experiences working with app-based taxi companies. Here, these drivers share their perspectives on how new technologies have transformed their lives and livelihoods. My, हम लोग टूरिस्ट कोई बाहर से आए हम लोग होटल से और पिकनिक स्पॉट से पिकअप करके हम लोग सर्विस करते थे लोगों जब ये एंड्रॉइड फोन्स और एप्स से कंपनीज आया तब हम लोग को ये अट्रैक्ट कर दिया कि इंसेंटिव रूप में ऐसा सिस्टम था तो आने ना स्टार्ट करते थे पर बट इससे बिजनेस हुआ नहीं पर फिर और उसके बाद में थोड़े प्रॉब्लम्स भी फेस करे पावर फुल हुआ और डिस्ट्रीब्यूशन में ग्रोन में और किसी उसका हम जाके पूरा डॉक्यूमेंट दिया दोनों आगे कॉपी दियो फुल दियो बैंक दो ये सब मिल जाता था हमारा डॉक्यूमेंट दो ऐसा सर्विस देता था हमर को देता था अभी हमारे को दिखा के सरकार देख रही दिखा के सभी बहुत कम देख रहे कभी हमारे कुछ तकलीफ है बोलो तो आप किसको गए तो अभी वो लगा बहुत सारे लोग लगा लेके हटा थे मगर फिर भी जबकि जो रेट था हाईवे से कंपनी आए अभी भी वही रेट चल रहा हम लोग को कुछ इम्प्रूवमेंट नहीं है उसमें वो इंसेंटिव भी ना जब पहले जो हम लोग को ज्यादा हाई एक्सपेक्टेशन से इंसेंटिव देता था अब वो आते आता लोग वो भी कम हो गए अब इंसेंटिव भी बहुत कम से आ रहा है हम लोग को स्टार्टिंग में जब ओला ओवर जब हैदराबाद में आए थे तो जब जो हम लोग टेन परसेंट कमीशन दे रहे थे वो लोग ले रहे थे दस परसेंट कमीशन अभी जो दे रहे हैं पच्चीस परसेंट दे रहे हैं But concerns around fair and adequate pay are not the only problems these drivers face. So technical issues are very many times. We are fighting with technology and we are working with technology. This company has taught us how to use an app. This company has taught us how to use a mobile and mobile android phone. And this company has taught us how to play this company. This company has taught us how to play this company. This company has taught us how to play this company. For example, issues surrounding transparency and driver safety arise due to what are seen by drivers as unfair data sharing practices. Yeah. Our company, uh, 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 u
बहुत सारे ड्राइवर्स को जो है कैब बुक करके सिटी के आउटस्कर्ट्स में लेके जा रही है उनकी जान निकाल दी जा रही है और उनकी गाड़ी खींच ली जा रही है उनसे एक जुम्मेदार कंपनी को जरूर ट्रांसपेरेंसी रखना होगा जैसे कि ड्राइवर की ट्रांसपेरेंसी है तो कस्टमर की भी ट्रांसपेरेंसी होना चाहिए Transparency has also become a wider issue due to the opaque ways in which the apps have been designed. This has led drivers to question the motivations and methods of digital ride-sharing platforms. जो डिमांड एरिया नहीं है वो एरिया में सर्च नहीं मिलेगा वो ड्राइवर भी ना ये सर्च ऐप में ऐसा बताते कि आशा बढ़ जाता कि इधर सर्च है हम लोग अच्छा रेट मिले और जान बुझ के होना बोल के बुकिंग की थर्टी फाइव टारगेट करने को नहीं देखता होगा एक बुकिंग के पास रोक देता एक बुकिंग भी करने का बुकिंग भी देता ही नहीं रोक देता यानी कि एयरपोर्ट को जाता वहाँ रोक एयरपोर्ट को बुकिंग दे दे बजा के सही रहा भाई हमारे सामने कितने की गाड़ी आती कितने की गाड़ी करते लेकिन वो भाई वही है इसलिए कि ये हमारे पास कंटेनर ढूंढ के देना पड़ता है देखिए अभी बता रहा हूँ तो ऐसा लोगों को छुट्टियाँ बनाना हमारे मालूम भी क्या क्या छुट्टियाँ हैं बल्कि अभी हम कर रहे हैं इसलिए कि बाहर गए तो कुछ नहीं नहीं क्या कर रहे Challenges discussed by drivers go beyond this. Their concerns range from the lack of effective complaints procedures to the monopolization of the market by multinational corporations. In the end, the drivers don't feel confident in their abilities to address any of these challenges because of systemic opaqueness and lack of meaningful information. <laughs> समझ रहे बट उसको समझ के यूज करें समझ समझ के यूज करें तो हम भी ये सारे चीज़ को जो है अभी भी ड्राइवर्स जितने भी हैं चाहे डिलीवरी बॉयज हैं ये वर्कर प्लेटफॉर्म वर्कर्स पे जितने भी लोग काम कर रहे हैं तो हम सब ये चीज़ को अभी भी बहुत सारा सीखना है इसमें बहुत सारा पॉइंट्स है कंपनी आपस में बातचीत करना स्टार्ट करना चाहिए Not all of the harms caused by datafication result in a tangible loss of resources. Many of the harms uncovered by our partners instead center around the impact our ongoing digital transformation is having on individuals and communities, identity, dignity, or privacy. Specifically, the next two stories shared here center on online harms which disproportionately impact women and the LGBT plus community. From online harassment to privacy violations, the rapid encroachment of online realities into everyday lives has not impacted all groups equally. Women of Uganda Network is dedicated to exposing the widespread discrimination, harassment and abuse experienced by women in online spaces. As part of this work, they spoke to Sylvia Rwabwogo, a former member of parliament in Uganda, about her experience of online abuse. This story shares just a fraction of Sylvia's personal story and the impact it had on her life. It's used here to demonstrate the expansive impact online abuse can have on women's lives and livelihoods. My name is Sylvia Rabogo. I am a mother of four. Um, I'm also coming from the background of a teenage mother. I was a teenage mother. My girls are big, my children are big. Uh, I come from Kamarole District. I am a former member of parliament for Kamarole District when it was still one. Yes, for me as a woman, first of all, I want to actually even talk about my personal experience. Just as I said, I am not, I have tried so much to protect my family, to protect my children from that public eye because it goes with you. People want to go beyond just seeing you, to seeing your husband, to seeing who your children are, how your children behave and everything how your home is running so meaning there is no privacy for 
such a person. So you lose a part of you. My experience dates back in 2017. That is where my harassment started. So I came um, at that time. It was such a threatening experience. That is when the harassment started. I came face to face with harassment. At first, I did not notice it was going to be like that because I used to get calls from a person I do not know. Then the person now starts sending messages, a stream of messages. I think that whole period was about eight months until the time I went to court. During that time, I must have got over 1,000 messages on my phone coming from this young man. Following this breach of Sylvia's privacy, the harassment escalated, spreading into her digital presence on social media. The gender-based harms that followed illustrate the gendered ways in which online abuse can occur. They also reveal the widespread barriers to remedy faced by those who are trying to address such abuse. And then I had to go to court. So when I went to court, actually, um, the worst of it all, the harassment was it even went beyond because when I went to court, the way the media reported about my story in court, the very first story that was broke uh, that broke out in the media, the mainstream media, actually even caused a bigger a bigger problem because that is when the outburst came out on on uh, social media, Facebook pages, um, on, on, on WhatsApp, on Twitter, everyone on radios was discussing my my issue how can a woman how can a woman refuse a man that is vibing them besides she's a single woman so see how the public how society looks at a woman i am a leader nobody looks at me in my capacity as a leader and says no i think that that one went beyond the outburst pushed me off all these spaces i, I went off facebook because whatever comment i would put would be misinterpreted and then a hell of other messages would come. So because of that kind of harassment that I also experienced online, I withdrew from Facebook, I withdrew from WhatsApp, I withdrew from all those other spaces in order for me to have peace and settle again. These experiences faced by Sylvia illustrate how inappropriate levels of content moderation and oversight can enable the multiplication of online harassment and the amplification of online abuse. This suggests the need for fundamental changes to the governance of the digital environment. We need to support women to come up and stand for themselves. But also, um, the way we handle the laws and implement the laws still has a lot, leaves a lot to be desired. We need to establish safe spaces for women where women can be able to chat online and even talk to people offline, be able to be themselves online and offline without being attacked. These attacks actually are um, uh, online a lot, that women sometimes even have to withdraw from posting anything. Internet Bolivia have become crucial to running a digital SOS center in Bolivia. Key to this is a hotline which helps to support local communities and track examples of injustice across Bolivia. Through this, they have uncovered the disproportionate impact emerging technologies are having on LGBT plus populations online. In the Digital SOS Center, we did get this case. This is already public information. This isn't confidential. Um, of personal data abuse. Um, this case in particular was um, when COVID, uh, when well, when we were in the in the confinement, um, and cybercrime has has increased, and it really dispropor disproportionately affected um, LG the LGBT community that was online at that point. Information was leaked. Um, 
uh, gender, uh, gender identification, uh, sexual orientation, via, uh, HIV status was also leaked, which was stolen from Grindr, um, which is an online dating app for the LGBTQI community. One person involved in uncovering this case was Alex Bernabe, an activist based at the Fundación Igualdad LGBT in Bolivia. Las diferentes aplicaciones eh, afectan bastante a las personas de la diversidad sexual, sobre todo a hombres gays. Eh, hay dos aplicaciones que son muy frecuentemente de uso. Una de ellas es Grinder eh, y la otra es eh, también eh, Twitter. Hemos recibido dos denuncias donde en Grinder eh, hay personas que además de poner algunos datos personales, eh, pueden poner la posibilidad de, de estado serológico, vale decir, si vive o no vive con el VIH. Y alguien se dio la tarea eh, de poder conversar y lograr capturar las pantallas en las conversaciones donde la persona indica que es eh, VIH positiva. Eso lo ha llevado a otra red, que es la de Facebook, y ha puesto estas personas tienen eh, VIH, mostrándoles sus fotos y además mostrando una captura de pantalla de la conversación que han tenido. Eso, por supuesto, viola completamente en términos legales la confidencialidad sostenida eh, por la ley 3729. Exposure of sensitive personal information like this that are caused by a lack of proper platform governance can have devastating effects. En una sociedad como la boliviana, donde hay tanto prejuicio aún sobre tanta culpa y vergüenza eh, impulsada por una serie de, de, de segmentos de la población, es muy complicado que una persona diga abiertamente eh, si es que no tiene las herramientas su orientación sexual. Entonces, eso por supuesto afecta en términos de su vida personal, de su vida cotidiana y también a la seguridad, porque de las personas se les, se les está reflejando su, su imagen, su imagen, su, su imagen personal y también lo, los datos íntimos de la persona. Entonces, es algo que no se está regulando. This is just one of the many cases that we're seeing in the Digital SOS Center, um, which really makes us concerned and stresses the, the need for us to have a data protection law here in Bolivia. These cases of online gender and sexuality-based discrimination and violence show that data injustice is suffered by some more than others. Deficits in the governance of online platforms do not impact all communities equally, and disproportionate harm can be done to individuals and groups on the basis of identity, as these cases from Bolivia and Uganda demonstrate. These examples of data injustice demonstrate just how much work is needed to advance just data features. Yet, despite the scale of the challenge, each of our partners have been making strides towards fair and equitable uses of data. Join us for our final episode as we turn to this hopeful story of research, activism, and future change. At Engage Media, uh, we do a lot of work around data justice. Right now, we've been trying to look for solutions here in Bolivia as to what um, data justice means from our perspective. We try to participate in the development of the legal framework for data justice. Um, and we're trying to do around data justice.
Ladies and gentlemen, the event will recommence in 10 minutes. Data and digital innovation practices are rapidly evolving and expanding. These advancements are impacting people's lives more and more each day. In a world that shapes and is shaped by data, important questions arise about how we can promote human rights and principles like fairness, equality, and self-determination. The Advancing Data Justice series explores these questions with 12 organizations from across the globe that are working for fair, just, and equitable uses of data. In other words, data collection and use must not undermine the pursuit of a society that is equitable, fair, and capable of confronting the root causes of injustice. In the previous episodes, we uncovered unjust data practices that can be exploitative, invasive and put people at risk so meaning there is no privacy for such a person so you lose a part of you es muy complicado que una persona diga abiertamente eh, si es que no tiene las herramientas orientación sexual in this final episode of the advancing data justice series we hear from our global partners on how they mobilize for data justice through their transformative activism and advocacy. They shed light on the actions we need to take now to challenge and disrupt long-standing structures of inequity. As these advocacy groups and activists explain, listening to the voices of impacted communities is key to building equitable data futures. Currently, the voices that are heard in the debate on digital rights in Chile are members of Congress, academics, and the representatives of nonprofits that advocate for digital rights. But we need to have a wider discussion with more groups from civil society, indigenous people, immigrants, women's rights. This is important because data represents these groups and also is used to make decisions about them. Despite the daunting challenges, grassroots activism and advocacy have a significant impact impact by mobilizing communities for data justice. Up next, we hear from the organizations and communities 
that are driving positive change from the ground up and how their efforts span across local, national and global contexts. By raising awareness and amplifying the lived experiences of vulnerable groups, these organizations are creating meaningful avenues for communities to participate in decision-making processes. I think everyone should be concerned about data justice, um, what it means to them individually, what it means to them as a collective. Um, I do think everyone should be engaged in this conversation. I believe a big part of enabling uh, this conversation to occur um, will is, is um, education. Um, and this will have to be done collaboratively between the government and private institutions um, just to engage uh, a, a larger portion of um, the populace. But I, I think education has to be the first thing. So education on data, however that occurs, um, and then we can move on to the, to the discussions on data justice. At Engage Media, uh, we do a lot of work around data justice. I think the biggest work in the Asia-Pacific lying ahead is creating awareness around societies of the countries here that data is being collected uh, in numerous ways. And, and how can we do that? Well, it starts with, with writing articles that are contextualized in local language, in, in, in Lao language, in Vietnamese, in Thai, in, in Burmese, uh, because now English is really the language that's dominating. A big win can be made if we can contextualize all this knowledge and also make it culturally appropriate so that people are more inclined and interested to read about these things. We are at the moment trying to figure out that how do you engage with community about data and community, data literacy and community, data rights and community, data privilege and community, data uh, justice and community and so on and so forth so so the, so the understanding of data how does it lead your, your life how does it deal in your life is now our literacy agenda and we are very happy that we are actually trying to simplify the meaning of data the exploitative nature of data or the bureaucratic nature of data or the business of data or the rights of data Highlight Highlighting the voices and knowledge of the community is essential to uncover power dynamics and to empower those marginalized within data ecosystems. How can this important work be undertaken without creating additional burdens for impacted groups? Activists and advocacy organizations strive to counter this by closely working alongside impacted communities. I think the current conversation around around technology and, and society also include these groups. For example, as, as women of Uganda Network, in all our work, we use the gender evaluation methodology, which tries to mainstream gender in all our research programs and also uh, in the policy analysis. And of course, we also try to ensure that in the research we do, we include 70% of, 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 of women and then 30% of men, so that we try to get the perspective of both the men and the women in conversation around policy, uh, data, data protection and privacy. Although um, there's still a huge gap maybe in the uh, digital gender divide. If we consider the, the, the example of Cameroon, here we have uh, more than 214 uh, tribes with more than 240 or so languages. And each tribe has its, uh, its realities, its cultural background. The, the realities that some areas are facing are not the same realities that other areas are facing. There is a need not to completely change the, the, the rules in 
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The event is about to start. Amplifying local perspectives and shedding light on their specific contexts, activists and advocacy organizations also foster multilateral collaborations to ensure impacted communities can actively contribute to data policy and governance processes. We've already talked about the importance of the participation in the process of data governance. However, I think its efforts cannot be only made by the governments and the private sector. We also need the third sector to step in and grow faster to really empower citizens. In China, we don't have a strong history about the third sector to step in and grow faster. One of the problems is that usually it's not really welcomed by the government, but also is there's not a lot of resources ready to support this kind of organizations as well. So what I want to see next five years is to see much more professional third sector organizations can step into the zone. Hey, greetings and welcome back to the afternoon proceedings for the AI at a Turing Point event. Uh, I'm Greg Slabaugh. I'm director of the Digital Environment Research Institute here at Queen Mary. It's Queen Mary's flagship institute dedicated to digital and data science, including AI. We started Dairy about three years ago and we developed a strategy focusing on pressing challenges facing society, including using AI in healthcare, AI for the environment and sustainability, and trustworthy and responsible AI. And this is the theme that David Leslie is leading. We'd like to uh, continue with the next session today, dedicated to inclusive international AI governance in the age of foundation models. In keeping with the focus of some of the program elements this morning, this panel will focus on generative AI but this time with a particular emphasis on the role of standards and evaluation methods for the governance of these kinds of AI technologies. This session is co-organized by the AI Standards Hub. We will hear more about the Hub's mission in a moment, and we will consider what kinds of standards and evaluation methods are needed to govern generative AI technologies effectively. In particular, we will look at the importance of inclusive international cooperation in order to develop standards and methods that take account of the diverse communities impacted by generative AI systems as they are deployed around the world. We are fortunate to have a great set of four experts as panelists for this session. They cover a wide range of geographical perspectives and through their experience, they are uniquely placed to comment on the topics just mentioned. This panel will be chaired by Dr. Florian Ostman. 
Florian is the head of AI of governance at the Allen, sorry, he's the head of AI governance and regulatory innovation at the Allen Turing Institute, where he leads a team working on a diverse range of aspects of AI governance across regulatory and non-regulatory governance mechanisms. As part of his role, Florian also leads the Turing's work on the AI Standards Hub. I will now hand over to Florian to introduce the panel. Florian. Great, thank you very much, Greg, for that introduction, and welcome everyone to this uh, first afternoon session on inclusive AI governance in the age of foundation models. Um, we are joined by two speakers on the stage, and then also two speakers online. Let's see if they're uh, online, if we can put them on the screen. There's Chiara and Sebastian is also hopefully going to appear in a moment. Now, before I introduce the speakers, um, let me say a few words about the background, the motivation for the session and also tell you a bit more about the AI Standards Hub that Greg already mentioned. So the AI Standards Hub is an initiative that was launched a year ago um, that's very much focused on thinking about the role and the need for standards for AI technologies, especially international standards. It's uh, rooted as an initiative in the national AI strategy and uh, delivered as a partnership between the Alan Turing Institute uh, the British Standards Institution and the National Physical, Lab National Physical Laboratory uh, here in the UK. And what we're trying to do with the AI Standards Hub is a combination of knowledge sharing, awareness raising, but also community building and engagement, uh, more active involvement in the AI standards landscape across all relevant stakeholder groups. So, uh, thinking about the involvement of industry, of course, but also, importantly, civil society, regulators, and uh, academic researchers in this space. Now, when it comes to thinking about generative AI um, and foundation models, which, you know, in many ways has been a focus of discussions in the context of the AI Summit in the last couple of weeks, um, there is relatively little formal standards development um, dedicated to those types of technologies. So a lot of the um, standards that we see being developed in ISO, for example, as an international organization or SENSENELEC at the European level, um, so far are focused on AI in very, very broad terms or types of AI applications that are sort of less close to the frontier of innovation um, compared to generative AI and foundation models. And so we thought, as a, you know, it, it'd be fitting um, in the context of, of the discussions that we're having this week, uh, the AI Safety Summit, uh, this broader event today, um, to come together um, with a panel to think specifically about the need for standards and evaluation models in relation to these um, more cutting edge forms of AI. And I couldn't really think of a better panel uh, with whom to discuss that topic um, than the four experts that we've been able to secure for the next 40 minutes. I'll briefly introduce each of them in turn. Um, I'll start with our two guests on the stage. Uh, first, there is uh, Rebecca Finley, who is the CEO of the Partnership on AI. Uh, the Partnership on AI was founded in 2016 and is a nonprofit organization bringing together international multi-stakeholder community and, and organizations across academia, civil society, industry, and media organizations to address challenges and questions around uh, AI and sort of work towards achieving positive outcomes for people and society around AI. And an important part of uh, PAI's work, which I'm sure we'll hear more about, consists in developing tools, recommendations, and other resources that can be turned into actionable guidance um, for AI developers and users. Welcome, Rebecca. Um, next on the stage is Arushi Gupta. Arushi is a research manager at Digital Futures Lab, which is a multidisciplinary research network that examines the complex interactions between technology and society in the global south, specifically. Arushi's research focuses on emerging issues um, 
at the interface between AI and socio-economic realities, and has been involved in a number of projects that are particularly relevant to today's discussions, including a project that involves working with organizations seeking to deploy generative AI in low and middle income settings, and uh, also a project on gender biases in large language models with a focus on non-English non uh, languages, again, in a low resource context. Welcome, Arushi. And then online, we have Sebastian and Chiara joining us. Um, Sebastian Hallensleben is the head of digitization and AI at VDE, the Association for Electrical, Electronic and Information Technologies based in Germany. And Sebastian has sort of occupies a whole range of important roles in the international AI governance space. The uh, most relevant role for today's discussion is Sebastian's role as the chair of the Sen Senelec Joint Technical Committee 21. Now, for those of you less familiar with AI standardization, Sen Senelec is one of the European standards bodies, and the Joint Technical Committee 21 is the committee that is in charge of developing the harmonized standards that will develop the implementation of the EU's AI Act. So that's the committee that Sebastian is chairing. But in addition to that, Sebastian is also involved in the OECD, um, among other things, chairing the AI Risk and Accountability Expert Group. Um, he's also been involved in work at the Council of Europe and UNESCO, among others. Welcome, Sebastian. And then last but not least, um, joining us online is Chiara Giovanni, who is a Senior Manager for Policy and Innovation and also the De Deputy Director General at ANEC. Uh, for those of you who haven't heard of ANEC before, ANEC is an international nonprofit with the mission of representing consumer perspectives, specifically, in uh, standards development processes at the European level. So Chiara will also be able to speak specifically to the work that's happening in San Senelec um, from a consumer angle. Apart from her role as the Deputy Director General, Chiara leads different forms of engagement um, and is responsible for horizontal and strategic policy issues, um, sits on various high-level committees um, and has, among other things, been involved in the high-level expert group that developed the ethics guidelines for AI at the European Union. So with all of that said, in terms of introductions, um, I'd like to start with the first round uh, for discussion. So the topic, as we mentioned, for the next uh, half an hour or so will be to think about generative AI and foundation models, the need for standards and uh, evaluation methods. And I'd just like to start with a fairly general round, an invitation for each of you to tell us a bit more about your work in relation to this topic. What do you see as the main issues related to generative AI? And then particularly, what kinds of standards, um, you know, what types of standards and evaluation methods do you see uh, as being needed uh, for the governance of uh, generative AI? And maybe we can start uh, with you, Rebecca. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, I just wanna say how much uh, I have valued for many years the Alan Turing Institute from its launch uh, and the work that you do and I think it's a phenomenal institution and I just want you to know that as an uh, international representative on this panel um, how much of a leading role that you have taken and are in fact uh, one of our PAI partners and have been for, for a very long time. So Partnership on AI was founded in 2016. Um, interestingly, we were founded at that time by the sort of six large technology companies uh, that you will probably know the name of and, uh, and now have about 100 partners. The vast majority of our partners are based uh, in civil society and academia. Uh, but we t continue to be very engaged with technologists and researchers who are based in AI companies or AI adjacent companies. And that allows us the opportunity to really dig into technical challenges before and in a way that before standards may actually come into force. So we do a lot of work focusing on setting community norms and community standards. I want to be absolutely clear. That does not mean I don't believe that regulation is very important. I believe regulation is very important. I also believe technical standards are one of the often overlooked 
mechanisms internationally to advance responsibility um, uh, with regard to AI. And so I think with regard to the ecosystem of initiatives, I'm really delighted to be on the panel today and talk a little bit about the work that we're doing, specifically around generative AI. I'll just say really quickly, uh, about a week ago, I'm losing track of time, I apologize. I uh, had the delight to announce the release of our foundation model guidance for safe deployment. This is, um, I can talk a little bit about it, but this was an initiative that has been underway for about a year. Um, and we're really, the most important thing I need to tell you right now is it's open for public comment and consultation. So would absolutely welcome uh, anyone's advice uh, and perspective as we move this work forward. Thank you. Great, thank you very much. And um, I'm sure we'll, we'll have an opportunity to come back to maybe some of the uh, processes and you know the, the, the way in which the, the guidelines were developed. It'd be interesting to hear more about that later. Um, Arushi, um, let's uh, continue with you. Um, your general thoughts on generative AI and the role of standards and evaluation. Yes. Thank you, thanks, Florian. Um, hi, everybody, I'm Arushi. I represent Digital Futures Lab. We are an India-based research collective. We're a very small team working on very big issues related to tech and society. And as any tech policy researcher, last two years, we've spent really catching up with the topic of generative AI and large language models, right? Um, and speaking something that's very relevant to everybody in this room, our recent work involves consulting with organizations in low and middle income countries, and that includes regions in West Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia. These are small and medium organizations who are trying to build LLM-based application based on base models, foundation models, and are deploying it for critical social sectors. So we've come in as advisors who would really help them translate this enormous, massive body of literature on principles, on ethics, and really help them apply it to their specific use cases. And those use cases are very critical and uh, uh, they have a lot of impact directly on the physical and mental well-being of people. So for instance, maybe it's a chatbot that is being built for producing sexual and reproductive health advice. Maybe it's a chatbot that is being built to provide evidence as well as insights on gender-based violence, right? With that, just to quickly cover the topic of LLMs, there's a lot of literature, there's a lot of gray literature as well emerging on this beautiful taxonomy of risks and harms that generative AI poses, right? But I think there are two key parts that's missing in this conversation. One is that none of the documents really deal with this conversation as to why generative AI for this particular use case. Sure, it can do it. It can converse with you. It can give you advice, but should it, right? So that's one element that's completely missing, which is suitability of a generative AI technology vis-a-vis -a, -vis a particular use case, a risk that isn't being really highlighted in the dominant discourse. The second one is very much around context. So a lot of the conversation around risks and harms is very westernized, right? So there's a lot of effort that we as Global South researchers have to put in really digging out examples about risks and harms of generative AI vis-a-vis -vis low resource context. So if, for instance, if the conversation is around how generative AI or any sort of AI technology exacerbates or perpetuates racial bias, we have to now contextualize the conversation with respect to India in terms of cost, right? The kind of structural inequities we're dealing with are completely different. And while standardization, of course, has a huge, huge role to play, I think this difference in context really puts almost a cap on what can you standardize and how much you can standardize, because there's almost a tension between standardization and context specificity. Yeah, I'll close. Great, thank you, and really interesting point. I think that we'll also try to come back to around the limits of standardization in the face of context specificity. Um, moving on to Sebastian and Chiara, um, and I think with that we're getting closer to sort of the formal standards development world um, with both of your roles at the European level. Um, maybe we can start with you, Sebastian. You're obviously you know, particularly close in your role as the chair, and um, among other things, I think it would be interesting to hear your perspective on sort of the evolving negotiations on the EU AI Act. We know that it's, it's very likely that there will be uh, provisions or, uh, for foundation models um, or in the EU AI Act. And, uh, you know, as part of that, it would be interesting to hear, for example, to what extent you foresee 
um, standards being developed through your committee that are specific to foundation models? Um, if so, what kinds of standards um, will those be? Um, and then, of course, any other general thoughts you might have on the topic? Yeah, thank, thank you, Florian, and uh, thank you for bringing us together. Very, 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 very good combination of, uh, of minds. Um, so on the European level, standardization has a very specific role um, in synergy with or complementing legislating, le legislation. So while the AI Act specifies high level goals or high level requirements, such as transparency requirements under certain risk circumstances, or requirements on logging or on fairness. It is the European standards that spell out at least one possible way of achieving this, of implementing those right requirements. They're not binding, that's very important to note. Um, even those harmonized standards are not binding, you can ignore them. But if you follow them, um, you are in the safe side in the sense that you are assumed to be in conformity with uh, European regulation. And so the standardization at the European level, uh, picking up on, on Arushi's point, is very much context uh, dependent in the sense that it is uh, designed to underpin exactly European regulation. Now that means, for example, that uh, although we uh, copy or modified copy uh, a lot of international standards as far as, far as they are available, there's no, no need to reinvent the wheel, uh, we also have quite a bit of work to do over the next few years to uh, create standards or to modify standards for European purposes and adapt to the, to the AI Act. So in that sense, standards are really a way of facilitating the implementation and to avoid, to some extent, the situation that we had, for example, with GDPR, where there was only the regulation and everyone interprets this regulation differently uh, and it's a, it's a burden, in particular for smaller organizations, um, organizations without access to, to uh, uh, legal advice to try and make sense of it. And uh, that is because for GDPR, there were no standards, there are no standards. So for the AI Act, we're in a much, in a much uh, better situation there. And that just, just as a quick introduction, the final, final point I want to make is that the focus on generative AI today is very, very appropriate. Uh, we started at BDE in 2018, when deepfakes come out, to worry about generative AI and to uh, consider what it will happen with the digital space when everything, but also everyone, can be faked and uh, can be faked at scale. Thank you. Thank you, Sebastian. And Chiara, over to you for your thoughts uh, on this topic and, you know, specifically sort of the, the consumer perspective um, on standards development in this space. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, thank you for inviting ANEC. It's a pleasure to be with you. As mentioned, ANEC is the association representing consumers in standardization. Why do we do it? Because, as it has been explained, uh, some uh, legislation at the European level are making use of standards. The AI Act is one. We are going to have standards for high risk applications, such as the um, uh, real time and post remote biometric identification of national persons. It is a, a very um, sensitive field for standards. Um, it is a new field sometimes for standards. And as uh, Sebastian mentioned, the uh, future European standards will have the um, effect of providing presumption of conformity with the legal requirements. And I can push forward the, the explanation, which is a legal explanation, but it has also a policy effect, is that the manufacturers and the developers using them will not need to prove that their system is respecting the law if they apply the standards. There is a presumption of conformity, and therefore there is a reversal of the burden of proof. You understand that this system means that the standard has a very important role, but from a consumer point of view, they need to be impeccable standards in terms of content. Um, the standards that we are going to have, uh, and ANEC is participating in the elaboration of the standards with other stakeholders, 
um, they will specifically contain verifiable criteria and implementable methods to assess compliance with such with the specification. And these specifications will also be contained in the standards. It's a bit of a mouthful, but I think it's really the topic of this uh, panel discussion is to have specifications based on state of the art, technology based, process based and methodology based technical specifications in relation to the design and development of AI systems, including verification, validation and testing procedures. Um, what does it mean from a consumer point of view and from uh, a society point of view? Is that uh, the um, legal requirements will be implementable re via the standards. There will be uh, a validation and a testing uh, done by the, uh, uh, the developers themselves, but also by the public authorities using the standards for the market surveillance. This is a post-market effect that we don't have to forget. Uh, it's part of enforcement of the legislation. Um, focusing on the specific elements of generative AI, um, indeed, Florian, you mentioned at this stage, we don't know yet how and um, whether the um, generative AI will be covered by the future rule on AI in the AI Act. Uh, the initial proposal uh, of two years ago was not containing uh, such rules. Uh, and therefore, the first generation of standard that we are going to have will not cover that topic. It's possible that the final uh, act will contain provisions, and it's very likely we are going to get standards on that. But there is a bit of a problem of uh, timelessness there, of lack of uh, uh, synchronization. Um, and while such technologies, as, such as uh, ChatGPT, uh, can have uh, a lot of benefits and also useful applications for consumer, um, there are uh, some limitations and concerns that we need to address. Uh, the example is data collection. Uh, the, uh, the, the models they use uh, and they collect a lot of data, uh, personal data. Um, this extensive collection is, uh, uh, of course, uh, uh, of concern in terms of personal data protection, um, but also the uh, problem of the quality of the data, the presence of bias or not. Uh, you might remember uh, that uh, last year, the, um, or even it was this year, the Italian data protection authorities uh, suspended for a while the application uh, and the deployment of, of ChatGPT really on those elements of concerns of data protection. And so the standards, the, the future standards, should include the requirements for data anonymization, encryption, and se secure storage. Uh, but again, what is really key is the testing methodology, because those testing methodology are needed to show compliance and to support enforcement. And this is something that for the time being, we are missing. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much, Chiara. And I, I think that was a really good uh, sort of first round of, of scene setting. Um, we don't have too much time left, unfortunately, but um, I think one topic that I'd like to dig uh, deeper into is this question around context specificity um, and also, you know, how to address it, thinking about, as I mentioned earlier, you know, coming from the mission of the AI Standards Hub, we very much think about what is needed to ensure that these processes are inclusive. Um, so it'll be interesting to hear thoughts from each of you on, you know, what, what are some of the context specificities? What can we do to address them in terms of, you know, what does a process need to look like to make sure that all relevant perspectives um, are taken account of um, in the development of best practice and standards? And then potentially, as you said, Arushi, you know, what, what are the, some of the limits on the sort of universal, finding universal uh, frameworks. And maybe since you started with a provocation, maybe you, you, if you would like to share a bit more about some of the context specificities and sort of the, the implications coming out of that. Yeah. yeah, thanks, thanks, Florian. I mean, I can rant a lot about that, so <laughs> happy to take that. I think uh, the word context has been thrown around a lot, but I think what people fail to do is really get down to the brass tacks. What is it that we talk about when we talk about context, right? And there are multiple, multiple dimensions. If I have to just start with A, the structural inequities that look different across jurisdictions, and that's 
that's fine. There's still ways to sort of create benchmarks that can sort of address uh, different kind of heterogeneity in communities and really attack that issue. But the second issue that comes in when, it, when we talk about context is around state capacity, and that differs between the global north, the global south. And that state capacity is not just about the ability of regulators, of auditors to really monitor these technologies, but it's also about state-citizen relations. In a lot of countries, you don't have the kind of community engagement, civil society engagement that we see in a lot of Western contexts. So for instance, the case of the Babylon Healthcare app that came up and is being very widely discussed in the UK is not a luxury that is enjoyed by low resource contexts where there is little engagement, little monitoring and little public discussion around these technologies, whether it's because of lack of capacity or whether it's just a traditional legacy issue that these resources face, right? The other aspect around LLMs and context is language. And this is, of course, coming from simply our own analysis of the field of benchmarks on large language models, that there isn't enough data sets, benchmarks that we can use to evaluate models that are not built for English. And that could be Spanish, French. That could also be Indic languages. In India, we have a lot of 20 plus regional languages. And a lot of organizations are building chatbots in those languages. right? Um, the other thing that is very important when it comes to context is the use of generative AI. And one of our observations has been that when we talk about developed context, the focus or the use case of Gen AI has been on enterprise productivity, right? How it can help you fasten this one process at work. But when it comes to low resource context, and this is Kenya, this is India, this is Bangladesh, the conversation is around critical social sectors. OK, can an AI chatbot replace a doctor, a nurse, as the first point of service, right? The stakes are completely different in developing countries because Gen AI is already being deployed in those areas in these contexts. I also feel, and if I have like a minute more <laughs> just on this topic, is when we talk about international cooperation on this issue, one thing I think we keep sort of forgetting or not paying enough attention to is that each country is on a very different track, right? And those tracks could be one is your generative AI deployment track. I would say that Global North is slightly behind than Global South when it comes to deployment. I've already seen apps on Gen AI being deployed in communities in the Global South, which is not true for US and UK, because simply the risk-based, cautious approach that these contexts are taken. The second track is around AI development, where the kind of compute power that you see in Global North is unimaginable in Global South. Global North and Global South lot of distance, right? But there's still hope for convergence. Maybe decades later, we will kind of see that kind of investment. The third track, which I feel where the global north and global south will never converge, is the institutional track, the socio-technical regulatory capacity that is needed to manage AI is just not there right now in low resource context. And that's something to keep in mind when developing standards. Over to you, Rebecca. Okay. Yeah, let's maybe go back to you, Rebecca, and it would be interesting to hear how you know those points resonate with the work that you've been doing on developing the guidance that has just been published. I just, I just want to say that was amazing that you just, that just, I think you just encapsulated from a global perspective all of the real challenges across AI technology development, you know, even before generative AI, right? And it's just, you know, um, and it's all, it's so interesting to me um, within that broad context that you just laid out regarding around structural and institutional and all those differences, even within the minority world, there are also real um, differences and divisions around how generative AI, AI is playing out as well. So, um, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of, I'll, I'll talk about a, a few of them, but I just want to say it's all sort of like this little tiny context within the much, much more powerful and important context I think you just laid out. So, for example, um, you know, there's a lot of debate right now around um, what does safety look like in the generative AI space and the debate between 
the way we think about it, which is safety for society. So what are all those things that we think about in terms of current and uh, harms with regard to AI, and also the belief that better understanding current harms will better inform potential future harms, which we may not really understand right now. So, so there's that debate that's happening that I think is very uh, context specific. Um, and I have been really heartened to see, I have to say, uh, over the, my last week in the UK, um, how much I see the, di the discussion really starting to very much incorporate a much broader sense of societal risk and societal harm with regard to generative AI. And I, I hope that we'll continue to see that here and, and all around the world. So that I think that's one issue that is very uh, very much about context within, within uh, the application of generative AI. I think the other is this question of the reliance on technical evaluations and technical benchmarks versus broader socio-technical evaluations. And so when we think about safety, there's all sorts of proposals around having and developing better technical evaluations and benchmarks. And I think it's important that that happen and that um, that, that be attended to. Um, and yet that's only one piece of the puzzle, right? And this is some of the work that we have really focused on related to the synthetic media question within generative AI. So we called it synthetic media because we were talking about it before generative AI and generative media as a concept existed, but this is the idea of manipulating content, manipulating audio or visual or otherwise. And we're seeing technical approaches. You'll see that in a number of the voluntary commitments that have come out recently around watermarking or provenance. Um, but the challenge with each one of those proposals is that the technical piece only resolves one element of what does authenticity or provenance look like. And in fact, will probably require a number of different technical approaches to, to make that happen. And so the work we've been focusing on is what does the governance structure look like? What is we have two of our partners, one of them is the BBC, and that's where we were, were last, last week, but also the CBC from, from Canada, where I'm based. So these are media organizations that are really concerned and thinking about um, how do they better authenticate content in order to be able to, to provide accurate reporting in media. So thinking about those governance structures, what does it look like to disclose? What does it look like to um, appropriately report on uh, media. So those are some of the pieces that I think are also need to be attended to. And then the last piece is around inclusion. And I think some of the discussion around red teaming, right? We've seen a lot of that with regard to commitments and otherwise. There are really, in my opinion, no community standards around what good red teaming looks like. Um, and really, some of the work we're doing around inclusive and equitable Research and design is really hoping to start to say, what does it look like to make sure we've got the right diversity of voices around the table at the right points of the life cycle of the development of the models in order to make them, to make them more um, safe uh, for everyone. Great, thank you. I'm very sad to say that with a view on the clock, I think we are already approaching the final comments. So, um, sort of a last round of comments from you, Sebastian and Chiara. And I think, you know, f feel free to comment on any of the points that have come up. It might be interesting, sort of the, the, the point that Arushi raised around developers and users, for example, thinking about the, the complexity of supply chains around generative AI or, you know, foundation models. Any thoughts you might have on, you know, how the standards work that's happening at the European level relates to the responsibilities of developers versus users uh, um, would be interesting to hear. Um, the sort of the question of socio-technical, the socio-technical nature, right? We often, I think, we're trying with the AI standards, we're trying to avoid the term technical standards because that can often be misleading in terms of, you know, a lot of standards being developed, being process standards that aren't technical in nature. So any, any reflections on sort of how standards can cover the full range of socio-technical issues um, would also be really interesting. Yeah, um, so I think con context is a very useful word here. And uh, you, you, you've pointed out different context developers, users of AI systems are still um, kind of uh, thrown together in many, in many discussions. I would even widen the spectrum even further and um, distinguish the use of uh, AI and generative AI by good actors versus the use of generative AI by bad actors. And uh, there is a lot of good work um, 
out there on what the governing principles could be for good actors. And uh, Rebecca and the partnership of AI have been one of the trailblazers in, in developing these kinds of frameworks. And how, how do you deal with generative AI if you're one of the good people? <clears throat> um, but what we also need to consider is um, generative AI is already in the hands of bad actors, be they commercially motivated in terms of uh, generating uh, fake reviews at, at scale, for example, or be they um, um, politically or, or geostrategically motivated in terms of uh, distorting uh, democratic discourse, uh, flooding forums with bots or certain, certain viewpoints, simulating majorities and so on. And we shouldn't forget about that context of use of generative AI because uh, it needs a different set of approaches. Um, the more governance we put on the good people, if you like, um, and the more we think, well, yeah, we've got this problem in, in, in hand, uh, the more we risk forgetting about the bad actors. It's a little bit like, in, like in, in cybersecurity, where it does make a lot of sense to impose obligations on organizations to secure their systems and to, to meet certain, certain security standards. But at the same time, we also need to think about, well, what do we do about organizations that hack into systems, that sit in jurisdictions that we cannot reach, that are organizations that we don't even know uh, who, who is behind them, or if we do know, it might be state actors that are very difficult to deal with. And in the same way, we have to uh, consider generative AI, and we have to consider, well, how can we make the digital space resilient against the activities of bad actors with generative AI? How can we make the digital space resilient against a flood of bots or a flood of uh, fake content. And I do believe that um, this is not just a matter of media literacy, because fakes are getting too good. It's not a, a matter of fact-checking, because fact-checking isn't as scalable as creating fakes. And it's also not a matter, and I, this is an important point, it's not a matter of detection tools, because the best you can ever get with detection tools is an arms race, not solving the problem. We need to think much more fundamentally about how we trust uh, within the digital space, how trust is built with these people. Um, and uh, that's, in my view, the most important aspect if we look beyond the actual regulation and standardization. Great. Thank you very much, Sebastian. And Chiara, you have the last words. Over to you. Thank you very much. And in the interest of time, I will be very brief, but I will uh, leave you with a question, not an answer. Um, it has been mentioned that uh, uh, safety of generative AI is key. I would add that uh, performance is also very important from a consumer point of view. Um, we have uh, uh, consumer trust that has to be built on the expectation that the system is doing uh, what is expected to do, what is intended to do, and what is foreseeable it does. And uh, it, there are safeguards against the risks. So, as mentioned before, we are going to get metrics to, men to measure all of that uh, for different purposes. Um, and uh, um, looking at the approach that uh, has been uh, adopted at European level, those metrics will be contained in standards. Uh, we didn't have the time so much to discuss, but uh, um, there is a, a very strong push to have international standards used at the European level. Just a couple of statistics um, in the field which are relevant for uh, AI, uh, electrotechnology and digital society, 74% of European standards are identical to international standards. So the European market is a very open market. Um, but when discussing about safety of uh, uh, AI in general, or generative AI uh, performance, uh, such metrics, should we leave uh, this decision to the standardizer? Uh, and the majority is coming from international big tech industry, or as it has been mentioned, also some uh, uh, links with uh, state actors. Uh, should there be a democratic scrutiny about the content of what is standardized and where the standards are developed. This is the question I would like to leave you with. Great, thank you, Chiara. And I think that's, you know, I couldn't think of a better question to, to uh, follow that up with a call 
correction for any of you who are interested in AI standardization to understand the landscape of that's evolving quite rapidly around uh, standards development for AI, both at the international and the European level, uh, to sort of take a look at uh, some of the resources we've developed with the AI Standards Hub. You can find our website at aistandardshub.org. We have uh, some live events coming up, um, including uh, with uh, the National Institute for Standards and Technology in the US. So there's a lot more coming. Unfortunately, we've run out of time to go deeper into the topic today, but uh, yeah, there'll be plenty of opportunity um, in the future if you're interested. And uh, yeah, with that, all that's left is to say a big thank you to our speakers, Arushi, Rebecca, Chiara, Sebastian. Thank you very much for joining us and uh, to all of you for listening. Thank you. Great, I'm very excited uh, to arrive at this landmark moment for us, the launch of the National Public Sector um, AI Ethics and Governance in Practice Programme, which is a series of eight workbooks mandated in the UK's National AI Strategy that will update the UK's official public sector AI ethics and safety guidance. We will start with a short video from Lord Clement Jones, a strong ally an advocate for putting ethical values, principles, and practice at the heart of UK's public sector work. Lord Clement Jones, CBE, is the former chair of the House of Lords Artificial Intelligence Select Committee and co-chair of the All-Party Parliamentary Group on Artificial Intelligence. He's a liberal Democrat peer and their spokesman for digital in the House of Lords. Lord Clement Jones is a champion of the creative industries and has a broad range of other interests, including China and the Middle East, online farms, cancer services, and pharmacy. He's president of Ambitious Autism, the National Autism Education Charity, and chair of the Council of Queen Mary University of London. Uh, here he is. Well, uh, good afternoon. Uh, both as the co-chair of the all-party group uh, on artificial intelligence in Parliament and as the Chair of Council of Queen Mary, I'm absolutely delighted to have been asked by Professor David Leslie um, to say a few words before uh, uh, the launch today of the AI, AI Ethics and Governance in Practice programme um, as part of the AI at a turning point, how can we create equitable AI governance futures fringe event. Uh, before the AI Summit on the 1st and 2nd of November. For a very long time, I've been extremely interested, uh, not to say concerned, about the use of uh, AI automated decision making uh, in the public sector. And indeed, I've put forward uh, private members' bills uh, on that subject because of the sheer uh, uh, importance to ordinary citizens um, of the quality of decisions made um, by uh, uh, automated processes, AI, uh, in many cases, uh, in the public sector, particularly um, in areas such as uh, social security, but also uh, uh, in public authorities such as the police, um, through uh, systems such as live facial recognition. So I was absolutely delighted um, to see uh, that we now have uh, uh, the building on the original guidance by um, the Turing um, and the Office for AI uh, on their uh, national public sector guidance on AI ethics and safety, um, which uh, uh, really, for my money, is an absolutely crucial um, step forward. Um, this is taking uh, uh, the guidance, the original guidance, to a level of detail uh, that we haven't seen before. And I must congratulate uh, David and his colleagues um, at Queen Mary uh, and at the Turing um, for doing uh, the work involved. Um, so I very much hope that uh, this will be taken on board. Um, these workbooks really do seem to me to be um, not only detailed, but highly practical in terms of uh, what they uh, deliver in terms of process-based governance. Um, and uh, uh, I think it really will lead um, not only to an increase in trustworthy um, public sector AI, uh, but also to increase public trust 
uh, in public service use of AI, which of course um, is what we're all aiming for. Uh, next steps, I hope, will be uh, a greater commitment um, to uh, compliance and uh, with the uh, uh, new central body um, promised by the uh, white paper, which seems to be coming into force. I very much hope that will play a part um, in making sure that we really do see um, uh, these, these uh, workbooks, this guidance uh, taken forward uh, in every corner of the public sector. Uh, uh, and uh, I think this is going to make a, uh, a huge difference um, to the quality of the use of AI in the public sector and the way that uh, uh, fully or partially automated uh, decisions are, are made in particular. So congratulations to everybody concerned. Um, I'm sorry I can't be there, um, but I very much hope that uh, the launch is a great success today. Thank you. Super. Our final keynote today is given by Professor Helen Margit. She is Professor of Society and the Internet at the University of Oxford in the Oxford Internet Institute. She is also the director of the Alan Turing Institute's public policy program, which develops data science and AI to improve government and policy making. Before her position at the Turing, Professor Margit was director of the Oxford Internet Institute. She is also UCL's first professor of political science and director of the School of Public Policy. She has a Bachelor of Science in Mathematics, an MSc in Politics and Public Policy, and a PhD in Government from the London School of Economics and Political Science. Professor Margit's research focuses on the re relationship between technology, governance, uh, government, and public policy. She authored numerous books, including Political Turbulence, Digital Era Governance, and tools of government in the digital age. Prizes and awards include the Technical University of Munich's Friedrich Schiedel Prize for Research and Research Leadership, the OBE for Services for Social and Political Science, the Klug Senior Chair in Technology and Society at the Library of Congress, a Fellow of the British Academy, and the Meyer Struckman Prize for Dig Digitalization and Democracy. She's writing two books at the moment, how Can Democracy Work? and Digital Area Governance 3, the Data-Intensive Digital State. Please join me in welcoming okay. Professor Margaret. Thanks so much, uh, Cosmina, and it's really great to, to be here with everyone. Um, I was actually at the, the other AI summit yesterday, um, so I'm having quite a varied week. Um, but I, I really think that sort of being here today and discussing the, the things that we're discussing feels like um, a, a kind of welcome return to the good work that we do at, at the Turing and so many of, 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 of you do. Um, and I just, uh, I'm here to give it a little bit of history and context um, to the public sector uh, workbooks that are being launched today. Um, because this represents the culmination of a very long-running stream of research in the Alan Turing Institute Public Policy Programme, um, led by uh, Professor David Leslie and his team, his team on ethics and responsible innovation research. Um, I set up the public policy program at the Turing Institute together with Cosmina, who um, uh, uh, you've seen several times today, um, and is now co-director of the program. And we, we, we set this program up. The, the Alan Turing Institute is the National Institute for Data Science and AI. And we thought there should be part of the Turing Institute, the National Institute, that was dedicated to AI for the public sector. Most AI is developed by the private sector for the public, for the private sector, for, 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 for private benefits. We wanted there to be part of the National Institute, which was about the public sector, public good. Part of the history um, of that is that I wrote my PhD about uh, large-scale um, computer systems in government in the US 
and the UK um, are the kind of systems that we like to forget about now. Unfortunately, some of them are still there, can you believe it, um, in, in, in government constraining today's technologies. But at that time, absolutely nobody was interested in this topic. Um, you wouldn't have had, for example, um, uh, you, you good people filling, uh, almost filling this room at the time I wrote my PhD. It was a, a lonely activity. Um, <coughs> I was a lonely figure in the LSE senior common room. Um, so, of course, when we set up the public policy program, we weren't sure how, how many people would be interested. But we went all over government um, talking to public officials and seeing where they thought AI might make a difference in their work, how it might solve the kind of problems that keep them awake at night. And what we found is, first of all, we found tremendous interest, actually, hu huge interest, which is very welcome and has continued you will have seen hundreds of press releases and public sector documents over the past couple of years, or two or three, even four years, um, mentioning AI as a core part of, of, of what the public sector does and what we should think about. We found a huge interest. We found, and, and then the kind of questions that people had were really divided into two. About half the questions were about technical capability and expertise, um, uh, uh, as you might expect, because um, the other thing that um, my PhD showed was that government was having a very difficult relationship with technology, and there have been many failures of technology in government, and, and, and getting the technical expertise um, is a challenge. But the other half of the questions were the should questions, were, were, were based around the thing, kind of things that we're, we're, we're talking about today. They were concerns about how to, um, how to get access to some kind of framework which would facilitate responsible innovation so that they wouldn't have to question what they were doing all the time. And that has been uh, a, a, a very large stream of our work ever since then, trying to tackle these should questions with um, a, uh, this emphasis on ethics and responsible innovation. So back in 2019, um, when GPT-4 was just a gleam in the corner of GPT-2, um, I just looked it up, that's right. Um, <laughs> Well, we were asked by the Office for AI and the Government Digital Service to produce the public sector um, guidance that a couple of people um, have referred to um, for the safe and ethical use of AI in the public sector. Um, that remains the, the official guidance. Um, and I, I really feel uh, very, very proud of that um, output of the program because it, it, it's Probably, I mean, I don't know if I can say this for sure, but I believe it to be both the most downloaded um, guidance on that topic and the most cited guidance on that topic. And to me, that really shows um, something that I've always believed, that there can be um, a really helpful, completely synergistic relationship between academic research and kind of practical support and help um, to uh, government, um, and I, I, I see that as a really um, important uh, kind of result of that, of that guidance, the, the illustration of the feasibility of that, because in the past there has been hesitation on the part of academic researchers sometimes to kind of get their hands dirty uh, with the real world, and I've never felt like that. Anyway, um, so the guidance has been there in 20, uh, uh, was there an official and really provided some of the ethical building blocks required for the responsible delivery of AI in government. In 2021, um, the UK's national AI strategy uh, recommended the update and expansion of the public sector guidance as a key action. Uh, which was a really great thing um, to happen. And David's team, many of whom you're, you're, you're meeting here today and know already, um, with the help of both Office for AI funding and funding um, from the Engineering and Physical Sciences Research Council, through which the Turing uh, uh, is funded, um, have been working on the AI uh, uh, ethics and governance in practice program. 
Um, the full, there's four guidebooks being launched today. The overall um, series will be eight guidebooks and a digital platform um, with tools, training, and support for the public sector. And I do feel that the stream of work and, the, and, 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 and what's being launched today really, to us, represent the kind of fulfillment of our very early dreams for the public policy program of being to really able to offer um, both research evidence but practical support um, for the development and deployment of AI in the public sector. Thanks. Okay, so I lobbied, uh, I lobbied for a balloon drop, um, didn't, wasn't unsuccessful. Uh, my team would know that I would also lobby for a karaoke machine, uh, unsuccessful. Uh, actually, the, this is a, a, big, a big deal for us. Uh, we've been working on this uh, quite literally for about uh, roughly two years. Uh, and this, uh, this launch is the culmination of a, of a, of a large team effort. Um, thinking back to actually the original guidance, which was published in 2019 uh, in June, I just I look across the room and I, I recognize all of these important figures. And just for instance, Florian, who uh, has been uh, with the Turing for just as long as I have, going on six years now. Uh, Florian brought us actually brought us the public sector guidance because it was Florian's connection to the Office for AI that that brought in the draft, uh, the original draft guidance that they were writing. And I remember staying up almost all night, sitting in, in my kitchen, uh, and just furiously marking up the, what they had written. Um, and it, ironically, it was, it was titled uh, AI Safety and Ethics. And, and we remember we lobbied to switch it to AI Ethics and Safety. Um, and also, I see Cosmina, who's, who's been our you know, MC today. I remember when we, finished the guidance uh, and uh, we were under a huge amount of time pressure to get everything up. Cosmina, uh, I think uh, maybe regrettably for that moment, uh, a volunteer to write the summary that, that actually ended up on the gov.uk site. And I just remember that was, uh, that was a real difficult time, remember? And in any case, uh, I, I won't, don't want to reflect too much on it, but I, I'll just, you know, Helen did such a good job of, of introducing the guidance that I don't think I even need to, we have slides, I don't want to go into the slides. Um, the, we have uh, uh, copies of the um, guidance briefs by the door, I pick those up, and uh, these have now been published uh, on, our, on our Turing website. But let me, if I might, um, introduce uh, to the stage uh, the project team has, who has worked on it, um, so that we might uh, give them a bit of recognition if, if, you'll, if you'll work with me here. So please, uh, all of those who have, have been part of this, um, come on up. Uh, I'm seeing uh, Anto, uh, Antonella Perini, uh, Smera Jayadeva, Kami Rincon, uh, Connor Rigby, who's our amazing designer, um, without whom uh, none of the uh, none of the brilliant visual visualizations would have been possible. Um, so please, yes, if if you'll give them a round of applause. And uh, and and while while we're here and we're doing this, let me also welcome up to the stage uh, um, Im important uh, partners and stakeholders. Uh, May I welcome to the stage uh, Claire uh, Lesko, who's a, a senior associate in the uh, compliance team at the Equality and Human Rights Commission, and uh, Rob Bancroft, who's the uh, leads on a, um, the uh, leads uh, is the AI policy lead at, at the EHRC, the Equal e e Equality and Human Rights Commission. And I'll just say that the 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 uh, the significance of the work that we've been able to 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 do in, in virtue of the, uh, basically the, the piloting of, the, of this work with the EHRC has been extremely significant. And also say, if you do get to, to look at the AI fairness and practice guidance, uh, a lot of the focus, which is now on uh, 
the, a, a much more multi-layered approach, I think, to discrimination that thinks about the public sector equality duty, that thinks about um, this uh, difficult relationship between direct and indirect discrimination, that's in there now, and that wasn't there before. And, uh, and that's in no small measure uh, due to the important um, input and influence of the HRC. Um, and also Anna Thomas, who has fought for equality since the, the beginning of the, uh, of, the, uh, of, of the publication of the first guidance. Um, I will also, uh, if I might, welcome to the stage uh, Rebecca Wilson. Um, who is uh, a program manager at the Local Government Association. Hi, Rebecca. Um, the LGA, uh, yes. The, the LGA is, uh, for those who don't know, an absolutely essential um, piece in, in the kind of multi-layered uh, uh, kind of environment of, of, of regional and local governments here in the UK. And uh, the, the work that, they, that they're doing in trying to sort of sort of bring um, uh, the AI agenda to an upskilled uh, body of local authorities is, is really significant. And uh, I recognize there's not a, an additional chair. So what is it? You know, I can, oh, I'm, we're done. I'm just gonna stand here. Uh, so, uh, so thank you, thank you all so much. Uh, I was I was thinking uh, I might uh, begin with with some questions if that's okay. So uh, let me maybe start with with Kami. Uh, Kami's uh, been uh, the, I would say the central driver um, of much of the guidance uh, within the the team, uh, working now from the beginning of of their tenure at the institute uh, on really thinking about how to. Um, operationalize the practice-based approach, right, through activities, through group-based um, group activities and, and thinking along those terms. So, Kami, I wanted to ask you how you envision um, civil servants and, and government bodies actually putting the guidance into practice. I mean, what, what, what do you think the, the, the best routes to that is? Um. So I think there's two things uh, to consider, and this question really does have to do with the structure that we've opted for the program itself, right? So each of the workbooks um, essentially corresponds to uh, an actionable principle, right? So the principle of fairness, sustainability, um, accountability, et cetera. Each of these, what we have done is translated into processes that can be implemented in real world AI projects, right? So each of the workbooks really is aimed to train civil servants on how to conduct these processes. And alongside this training, we're also offering resources, right? We have templates for say, to implement the principle of fairness, you can have a bias self-assessment and we provide that template for the bias self-assessment. Um, so this is the sort of content side of the program. And this is um, bound to a way for us to scale the program, which is a train the trainer approach. So what we're hoping will happen is um, there will be AI ethics champions within public sector organizations that we will train in order for them to provide the training within their organizations and for them to implement the guidance within real world projects. With each cohort of AI ethics champions, we are scaling the project. At the end of the day, we're talking about a nationwide initiative, and we need this to be something that is scalable. So in terms of how I envision or what I hope for organizations, um, public sector organizations to, to do with this program, I really hope that they seize the opportunity, like Helen said before, um, public sector organizations and um, the partners that we've collaborated with both at the senior management level and at the level of civil servants, have really been um, demonstrating a real interest in practical guidance for answering the tricky questions around AI ethics. So I really hope that they seize the opportunity that this program offers by empowering their staff to become AI ethics champions and um, essentially spearhead the question of AI ethics and safety uh, within their organizations. Thanks, Kimmy. Claire. Um, I'm wondering if you can sort of share your own thoughts on, I mean, we could call it maybe the state of play for responsible innovation practices within the public sector at the moment. Uh, of course, you know, we're thinking 
specifically in the EHRC context in terms of, of uh, discrimination and human rights. But so what, how do you feel, how does the rubber hit the road right now? So perhaps I should introduce the EHRC, perhaps some people don't know us. We are the regulator for equality and human rights in Britain. So we cover England, Scotland and Wales. Um, and I remember the introduction from Gabriella this morning. Uh, we all pay public taxes. We all expect public bodies to think about equality and human rights when they decide to pay for services or good, or including AI. And so I, I would say that we've done work on AI for about two, two years now. So we're a bit of a new kid on the block. Um, but it, it's really important for us to be involved. And we've done some research on how local authorities are using AI out there. Um, and it seems that the, the approach is cautious. They, they try AI before deciding or not um, to mainstream it, which is a good thing to do. But we had a lot of conversation about, are you using AI? No, we're not. And like, well, we know you are using AI. Oh, yes, sorry, we are using AI. So there's a lot of issue with people out there not understanding uh, what AI is or whether they are using uh, digital technologies that involve an element of AI. So I think it's the first hurdle uh, for all of us to think about. Uh, and, and when people do realize they are using AI, then they have to think about equality uh, when using AI. And it's not merely thinking about whether using AI is going to lead to negative impact and discrimination. It should go beyond that. It should be about collecting data to see whether your AI is delivering the intended benefits for communities. And this is not really happening at the moment. Uh, the focus is on negative impact, biases, and mitigating this, which is good to, to, to see, but it's just not enough. It's not what the public sector equality duty, or we call it PSED, it's, an, it's a nice anagram to remember. That's not what the PSED is all about. That's not what the Equality Act, and you've got this great framework in Britain to think about equality. So I think it's about uh, thinking about that systematically. And I'm hoping that uh, the section we've done in your workbook and, and the training will, will do that for people to think about equality when commissioning AI systematically and in positive terms as well as negative. And I'll stop here. Yeah, and I would just say, you know, the, the, um, the public sector equality duty is such an important um, component, right? When we think about that extra bit in the public sector, right, that we need to think about the positive, the res positive duty, the positive responsibility to advance equality and to advance equality of opportunity, um, which I think is, uh, actually, it's one of the things, just uh, if, if, if I could just comment on that. It's one of the things that makes the public sector guidance um, significant for the public sector, but also a model beyond the public sector, which is to say, in writing guidance for the public sector, one really needs to be oriented to the public interest, right, in, in thinking through what types of content are going to go into that. And the public sector equality duty is just one example, right, of, of a, a kind of a positive obligation that uh, might not exist right right now beyond the, the public sector, but it's absolutely a crucial and, and uh, uh, essential um, piece. If uh, even an industry uh, or you know both SMEs or small and medium sized businesses and large corporations, that should be considered for, on their part too. And so, I think yeah. just to say that this has also been a, a reason why I think um, the there's been so much pickup for the guidance. It's because the kind of standards that are set are set for you know, a particular um, world of public sector duty and obligation, but it is really you know, a, a, a oriented to a, a better world, one which is, which is you know, fundamentally aimed at the public interest. Right? So I think that's, that's, um, that's why the significance of the, of the guidance, public sector guidance and, and this, this program ranges beyond just the public sector. So, uh, Rob, I'm, wonder, I'm wondering if, if you could tell us a bit um, about the, the work that's going on with regard to applying the, the regulatory remit of the EHRC specifically with regard to AI. Thank you. Um, so, building on what Claire said before, we published some guidance on the, on the, <clears throat> the PSED. Um, when was it last year? Yeah. Um, and, and the workbook's a great addition to those resources for public sector organizations when they're considering fairness in the AI systems that they want to use. Um, 
More broadly at the EHRC, we are, uh, we're working with our uh, other regulators, the ICO um, and, and others about how they are incorporating the fairness principle from the AI white paper into how we regulate AI. Um, for, for the Equality and Human Rights Commission, we think we're, we're the fairness regulator. It's, it's, part, it's everything that we do, everything we do is fairness, but there are, we know there are other definitions of fairness uh, in other regulatory remits and other legislation. So it's about us working together, collaborating where we can. Um, there's a lot we're doing with government to make sure that the approach is the right one. We've um, obviously fed back on the white paper um, and we're continuing to work with government on, on those things. Um, and we've just launched the Fairness Innovation Challenge alongside the um, Centre for Data Ethics and Innovation and the ICO where we're working with uh, innovators to identify socio-technical solutions to um, fairness in AI models and uh, uh, one of the use cases we've got in that is a large language model in health which is a really exciting thing for us to be part of uh, and hopefully we'll come, come up with lots of really good outcomes. Um, there's also a fair bit of legislation that is relevant in the AI space. Government has said it's, it's not rushing to regulate but it has obviously just passed the Online Safety Act, uh, which touches on a lot of AI in social media, potentially uh, large language models. And it's also um, got the, the Data Protection and Digital Information Bill, which is actually looking to weaken some of the data regulations in the UK uh, around automated, automated decision making and um, the, the need to do data protection impact assessments. Some of the work that Claire has done has identified that where public sector organisations are considering equality, they're only doing that as part of the data protection impact assessments. And if there's, no, there's not going to be any uh, requirements for organisations to do data protection impact assessments, we're really concerned that equality considerations and fairness considerations might drop off as well. Um, so there's a lot there that we're doing. Um, I think I'll leave it there. Perfect. Uh, Rebecca, I'm, I'm wondering if you can, can tell us um, how you um, envision local authorities putting ethics guidance like, like this um, AI ethics and governance in practice, putting that sort of into practice in the world. Yeah, well, first of all, um, it's fantastic to be here. Thanks so much for including a local uh, government perspective in this conversation. Um, just for context, local government is a significant part of the public sector, second to the NHS in terms of its workforce, workforce of about 1.4 million. Councils deliver thousands, almost, of services uh, on, a, on a daily basis, uh, some of which are to the most vulnerable people in society. So um, it's great that we're, you know, we really need to be part of that conversation on, what, on, on, uh, on AI. Um, the, the Local Government Association has called for um, a common set of standards on AI. Um, so it's great to see uh, the workbooks as part of that package and part of that journey. Um, in terms of the sort of practical application, uh, a couple of things I've mentioned. First thing is around sort of, um, I guess, maturity. Um, and, and sort of where, where we are on this at the moment is we want councils to be as mature as possible in their use of data and digital. Um, there are 317 councils in England, uh, and they are at different levels, as, as uh, Claire mentioned, of uh, curiosity and readiness in terms of using AI. So I think what these workbooks do is provide that sort of solid, consistent foundation um, to, uh, to support those who may actually just be thinking about a data strategy or those who are in a better position to sort of build and procure AI uh, or, may, or may already have, uh, have gone down that journey. Um, the second thing I mentioned is around governance. So councils are faced with many complex decisions sort of every day uh, and that process is supported by good governance. So it's good to see that these guides are going to you know, reflect on what good governance looks like, particularly around stakeholder engagement. Uh, so it's clear where those responsibilities lie uh, to ensure AI integrity. Um, if I can say a couple of other things, one is around leadership. So I think it's important to notice in local government, the separation between the kind of political and also the executive sides of councils. Uh, and in terms of political leadership, 
and sometimes as well at, at senior management level. Not everyone is comfortable in a digital environment um, and that can inhibit uh, well, both creativity and in innovation and also risk taking. So it's good to see that these workbooks use a language that is uh, less technical, uh, also with a strong uh, visual component as well, which does uh, help with those conversations uh, at a leadership level. Um, a couple of things to, to mention around risk. Um, Local authorities manage risk every single day, uh, but when it comes to innovation, as I've said, they can be fairly kind of risk averse. So that culture is hard to change at the moment, uh, particularly when uh, budgets are tight and you might be looking for, you know, kind of narrow solutions which look a bit safer. Um, so good to see the workbooks again, kind of raising awareness of risks and also importantly ways to, to monitor impact. And that does support a kind of risk uh, management process. And then just finally, one thing around uh, professional uh, capacity uh, and capability. So local government is packed with uh, loads of smart, uh, intelligent, highly capable, dedicated people. Uh, but there are capability gaps. Uh, and we know that they exist around data and digital. Uh, and, uh, but at the same time, demand for those skills is growing uh, um, at, at, at a significant rate. So because of this, local authorities will be thinking about how they can upskill their workforce, how they can realign their priorities. And again, um, these particular workbooks will help think through some of those workforce challenges in terms of what kind of skill sets do we need and how do we move forward from that. Brilliant. Um, I feel like I, I, I want to put the project team on the spot. Is that, is that okay with, with you all? Yeah? So maybe we'll start with, with Connor. So, so Connor, uh, it, one of the most important, I think, elements of these um, workbooks is, is the way in which we've tried to translate the concepts into kind of accessible visualizations. Um, I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about or, you know, the process that, that goes into that kind of translation um, that, you know, from, as we've, we've worked with you now for, I guess it feels like forever, but I wonder if you can talk a little bit about that kind of, uh, that kind of design moment where you're, where you're bringing all of these really complex technical and socio-technical concepts sort of to life through, through visualization. Sure, is this on? Yeah, it is on. Um, yeah, well, I mean, I've been working quite closely with the, the amazing researchers in the ethics team for a little while now, and they've done such a good job at, um, creating such vivid content originally for the workbooks anyway. So there wasn't really that much. I mean, the, 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 the case studies, for example, are already so vivid um, and um, were quite easy to transform visually because there was, such good, um, there was such good work that had gone into that in the first place. And then secondly, I think we, there's been a lot of conversations around how to create a, um, create a quite an uh, interlocking system of, um, there's so many different things going on in the workbooks in terms of values and principles and frameworks. So there's been a lot of open dialogue between myself and the researchers um, about how we can, how we can um, visualize this in quite a clear way and allow people to kind of really follow the, the structure of the workbooks and um, um, kind of complete the process in you know, in a, in, a, in, a in a clear as way as possible. So it's been, it's been a big collaborative effort, for sure. Amazing, and uh, Anto or, or Smera, both of you actually, I'm wondering if uh, you can tell us a, a bit about the, the sort of process of piloting, the, 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 you know, the doing the actual engagements and, and you know, reaching out to the various stakeholders uh, maybe uh, tell a little bit also who, who we engaged with. That would be great. Yeah, for sure. So for these four, first four workbooks we engage with Ministry of Justice, EHRC, ICO, we're currently piloting the last four workbooks uh, with a couple of other organizations from NICE uh, to, yeah, we also piloted with some um, competition doctors in training. Uh, kind of we try we try to approach different organizations within the public sector uh, so as you know different uh, governmental levels uh, different sort of domains they focus on and so on so as to grasp uh, the multiplicity of needs and that are within the public sector and as well like the deter heterogeneity of the structures and the, the potential needs that they have 
in terms of uh, the guidance. So it's been a nice, uh, yeah, kind of job of yeah engaging with them, having like the first conversations, understanding what are their needs, uh, what are the sort of things that they have identified already in terms of capacities uh, that they might need, as well as the, the type of support that we can give to them. Uh, so we envision that this is uh, like quite a comprehensive approach and, and kind of strategy to accompany this process um, within the public sector. Uh, Jan Smeret, do you want to? Yeah, I mean, you <laughs> summed it up perfectly, but if there's only one thing I could add on that is we often see a lot of the people that we pilot with as, you know, that developers, they work in MOJ, they work in the medical sector, but at the end of it, every single person is going to be impacted if the public sector chooses to use AI systems. So even as an individual yourself, you can respond to some of those activities in terms of your own lived experiences, what that means to you, what development looks like to you, and what you can add to that. So th that made it a lot more personal. And having that space to have a small group of people we workshop that with, to get that feedback, to make it better, and then really inform the, the ethics champions later on is, is, I think, central to that entire concept. And um, truly, it's a great job done by the original writers of this entire program to, to have really thought out those entire ideas beforehand. So big shout out to all of y'all. <laughs> so I, maybe I'll return to, to Kami for a second. So. I think that uh, one of the most evolutionary bits of the work that we've done um, for this particular um, iteration of the guidance has been to think about equitable stakeholder engagement, right? Think, really thinking about those ingredients that need to go into stakeholder salience and anal uh, analysis and positionality reflection and, and these sorts of things. I'm wondering if you could um, tell everybody a little bit about that journey and, and about the, you know, the, how we've how we've come to this kind of, uh, I don't know what to call it, kind of a recipe, right, of, of these various processes that are involved in sort of equitable stakeholder engagement. Yeah, I mean, I think that question is definitely a question around governance and, and who gets to say, you know, X AI system is ethical or is not, who, who has a seat on the table. And I think whilst we were developing this stakeholder engagement process, there was, there's two things that came up. One was the fact that stakeholder engagement is something that is very broadly spoken about, but it's not always um, practiced in the most meaningful of ways when it comes to decision making, right? And the other question that we had, and it's almost a balancing of tensions here, is um, how do we ensure that engagement, which is obviously something that comes with um, a, a need for resourcing, um, is proportional, right? So if an AI system has very low risk, is it worth you know, a significant financial um, investment, especially when we're talking about um, public sector organizations? So in, in sort of finding this balance between meaningful uh, having the meaningful participation of those impacted by AI systems and, on the other hand, ensuring that this is something that is um, feasible for public sector organizations, we established a sort of step-by-step -step process that considers these things. Um, and I'm not going to go through the process step-by-step. -step. In each of the um, briefs uh, that folks have, uh, the steps are there. But some key considerations there included, A, thinking about um, the possible risks of an AI project from the project planning phase, right? So before going into development. Um, and then secondly, thinking about the similarities and differences in experiences between the project team and those that are impacted. So say in, in the case of a local government, um, is the development team, um, are folks that are members of the local government that are involved in this project representative of say, the residents in said council. Um, and the closer um, that, that the, those, the more similarities essentially, um, or rather on the other side, the wider the gap, the greater the need for engagement. Um, and this is, um, like I mentioned before, a, a question of, of governance there. So the idea is we're trying to get at getting those that are most impacted on the table and making sure that their decision-making power is proportional to the potential risks that said project has on them. Prioritizing also the, the, um, the notion of nothing about us without us, right? which is, I mean, it, it's so, 
intertwined, right, with this need to ensure that you're including voices that aren't likely to be heard in a process that's closed, right? So. Yeah, and I guess one other thing within the process is, is what you mentioned around the stakeholder salience analysis. Like, not only are we looking at what um, general communities might be impacted, again, going to ex an example of, of residents, but rather looking at what identity factors and what contextual factors might make some residents more vulnerable than others to a particular AI system. And, and just for context, so we're talking the, 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 these concepts of stakeholder engagement process and positionality reflection, stakeholder salience, these are in the AI sustainability and practice work, workbooks. Uh, they're, they're, it was so long we had to split it into two workbooks, uh, which, is, which I think is <laughs> appropriate. Um, maybe I, I come back to Claire and Rob. I'm wondering, uh, we're off the page now, so you're getting, getting questions that are not uh, pre-prepared. Um, I'm wondering if you can uh, tell, tell us what you envision good to look like over the next sort of five or 10 years in light of all of this interest, right? Be, you know, a, a year, year and a half ago, it, it, there was a growing interest, but not like it is now. So I, I wonder what you envision as a, as a kind of, um, you know, ideal path forward, a progressive path forward. Uh, you talked this morning, or Gabriella talked about transparency trust, accountability, and that's what all this P said system that you have as a legal framework is about. Um, so what I would like to see is um, a repository of AI use by public sector. That'd be a good start in terms of transparency. Uh, indeed, Scotland's got it before. Um, it's uh, completely full up and running in England. I know that CDI is pushing for, for such a uh, repository. I think it'll be great for um, also people to realize they are using AI because this other organization is using the same system because this is where we are at the moment. So I think it'll be a great first step. Um, I think after that, I want a public body to engage with community likely to be affected by use of AI, likely to be affected not only negatively, also positively. There's, there should be this dialogue for, for trust to, uh, to, to, to shoot out, really. Um, and then after, I, I want them to think about, together with the community, about the equality impact of using this specific AI uh, technology before they decide to go ahead. And after, crucially after, is as important as before. Um, it was in the news not, not uh, about a couple of days ago. Uh, if you put white male in the room thinking about the impact of policy on COVID, you may not uh, get the impact this can have on different community who are not white British male. So it's really important to evolve community. It's really important to think about equality impact before adopting AI as well as after and being transparent about that, being able to report that you've done the job. So for example, you know, we look at predictive analytics. Um, it, it's great that uh, a lot of public body, a lot of local authority want to try to prevent homelessness. Great stuff using AI, great stuff. But is it working? And who is it working for exactly? And I think we're not there yet. People uh, seem to not really know whether they're using AI or not. Uh, then after, they're, they're not really confident saying that they are using data that relates to protected character characteristics under the Equality Act, and they should. There is nothing wrong about doing that. We've always been pro-data, the Equality and Rights Commission. This is how you understand needs and can respond to those needs. It's about how you use it. Um, so we've got those issues with transparency, not feeling confidence, um, uh, and, not, and not being able to build this trust and accountability that we, we have now. So what I want is more of those three things. Uh, transparency, accountability, and trust, that's it. Everything Claire said. <laughs> um, I think kind of building a bit more on uh, a broader definition of fairness beyond just equality and discrimination, I think uh, we really need to emphasize the importance of human rights in the development of, of AI systems and deployment of AI systems uh, across the public sector, but also I think in the private sector as well. Um, and speaking uh, self-interestedly as the regulator uh, in this space, um, it's really challenging to keep up and to be able to do as much as we'd like to be able to do with the resource, resources that we have. Um, we've had um, the same flat cash settlement for over 10 years 
which is an over 30% decrease in our budget. Uh, and when you compare that with the resources available to AI firms, we, um, we just can't keep up on, on that scale either. So um, more money for the regulators as well, please. More money for the regulators. Any uh, parliamentarians or policymakers in the room? Uh, Rebecca, uh, I believe you might have the last word, which is amazing. Um, so I'm just wondering, in your in your vision, how um, how the how these workbooks could be kind of picked up by local governments um, to do more meaningful engagement, to um, also have a. a a, a more informed relationship to vendors, things like that. What do, what do you see the most utility of these workbooks? Yeah, um, yeah, so just taking the point about working with vendors. Um, so our, our members, so the councils that uh, are in our membership, um, have uh, expressed challenges in both sourcing and procuring um, uh, AI technology. Um, I think what's worth mentioning is they do work in a legal framework already. There are already rules around procurement as there are for all, uh, throughout the public sector. And on top of that, local authorities will have their own values and principles. Uh, some of them are working through, for example, ethics boards to direct their commercial activities. So that stuff uh, will, will fit into that. Uh, a couple of uh, issues that have been raised through uh, talking to uh, officers working in councils. One is just about kind of project scoping, I guess. Uh, so just trying to work out kind of where can AI add value um, and what are its limitations? So particularly, how can it help transform a particular place, a particular uh, service? Uh, how can we uh, think about it in terms of our kind of uh, obligations to, to net zero, that kind of thing? Uh, so they'll be looking at where it can make a positive difference. And I think what the workbooks do would just kind of help unpick that sort of thing. Uh, similarly, in terms of kind of just um, uh, doing that job of unpicking is around market intelligence as well. So that's, uh, that involves kind of who is out there, but importantly, who is out there who um, is like us, you know, who, who are, uh, adheres to the same ethical principles as ourselves. Uh, who would be a trusted partner and how do you start doing that evaluation you know particularly kind of uh, before you get in when you're in that kind of pre-market stage how do you start thinking about who you can work with who's trusted um, again sort of scope and requirements that's in terms of thinking about the sort of features and functions that you might need from technology but at the same time it's about transparency so how is AI embedded in something that you are building or procuring uh, what components where's the data stored uh, what, what data is used to train it, um, how is it destroyed, what about cybersecurity, all that, those kinds of things. So I think really it's all about doing that bit around evaluation. So, um, so you can evaluate a solution so that you know that what you are buying, you are you know, purchasing responsibly. Uh, and then just picking up on the bit about kind of building that two-way uh, relationship between councils and, and their communities. Uh, first thing I'd probably say on that is that public services should always be designed with people in mind and not technology. Um, and so having that strong focus, as the workbooks do, on stakeholders uh, and harm and fairness really supports efforts to do that piece around designing services around people and their needs and, and their demands. Um, that is picked up again in the socio-technical uh, uh, perspective of, the, of uh, the workbooks. Councils hold a massive amount of data on both people and places. Um, but importantly to that is that, uh, as has been mentioned, there are data rights uh, surrounding the use of people's data, um, whether it be about them personally or other you know, things that have been collected about them in the, in the environment. Um, so a, jo a council's job is really to explain back to the community their proposals for how they want to make use of their data. Um, and that needs to centre around public value. So what is it that you're doing that creates better public value for your residents? It might be about making better investments. It might be targeting resources more effectively and efficiently. And it might be about, you know, doing your intervention work more effectively. Um, we, I think it's been mentioned throughout the day around transparency and explainability. These are tricky concepts. Uh, so unpacking that makes it easier to communicate what's going on underneath the bonnet. Um, and importantly kind of informing communities about why you've made some particular assumptions what your thinking is and how that is rooted in clear standards 
Um, I think that's really uh, important, both in maintaining public trust, but also in protecting the integrity of local services as well. Uh, and then just finally, just picking up on that point about trust, um, councils are on the absolute front line when it comes to local democracy. Uh, they, it, it, lots of reasons, not least because they do administer local elections, regional elections and national elections, that democracy bit is really important. Um, but uh, with it, that goes um, for, for local government and regional and national as well. But citizens want government at, at my you know, sector's level and, and uh, broader to keep pace with technology, um, and, but they want, that, they want to be included, they want to be informed, and they want to be assured that the technology that is being used is being used safely and is being governed properly as well. Great, well, thank you so much to, to all of, of, of these very, very smart and talented uh, speakers. And I mean, we can really see how lucky we are in the UK, right, to have this level of quality thinking about these issues. And it is a, it is a I think, you know, a unique feature in some sense that, that there is so much um, intellectual capital that, that's invested in thinking through all these issues uh, across regulators and, and obviously with, within the institute and uh, in, across the local authorities. So uh, I was told we were gonna be thrown out of the room, um, which means that we're concluding the day uh, at the moment, Cosmina will be happy that she doesn't need to do the wash up. Um, so I'd just like to thank everybody uh, for coming. Um, just to say, the, the, I, just the range of, of issues and views that were explored today, I think is, is evidence that um, this AI Safety Summit um, is, is actually, as I started the day saying, just you know, more, more than Bletchley Park, right? And it's, it's definitely, um, situated right in, in, in this kind of kaleidos kaleidoscope of views and, and kaleidoscope of insights. And uh, if I might just uh, quickly recognize uh, those uh, who have been an absolute essential part of organizing this event, uh, Emma, Tiana, Radhika, Yara, Isabel from Turing, uh, I, I mean, this, this would not have happened without them. So, so uh, a big thanks. Oh, Melissa and Bex from, from uh, comms here at uh, uh, Queen Mary. So thank you to everybody for uh, sticking it out with us. And uh, I hope you have a nice afternoon. <laughs>